Hey, so uh, first of all, I always say thanks because I, I, I appreciate uh, you guys taking your time out of your day to, and it's kind of early morning for us, so I appreciate you coming on and uh, and telling your story. Um, you and I uh, go kind of way back, so uh, it's good to catch up with you. Good to see you again, and uh, yeah, it's been so, so long. When's the last time we saw each other, do you think? I think the last time we saw each other was you came out to Colorado to give me an eval. Okay, that's what I do thought. You, do you remember that eval? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I do. Um, <laughs> we can talk about it right now or we can wait until we get there uh, in your in your journey. Or what do you want to do? Do you want to cover it right now since we broached the subject? I mean, I mean sure. We, we can just talk about that. I, there's, yeah. There's just, I, I just remember I, I came out or you came out and uh, – was Richie with you? So yeah, I think so. Somebody okay. was for sure. Yeah, yeah. Richie was there, and you were giving me the eval, and um, I, I think it was my first seventeenth eval. So it was just like drinking through a fire hose. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it went it went okay, but there was we we had a, we had some vehicle issues. <laughs> uh, you can tell you that, can tell everything. I don't care. Yeah, it's, man. All you're right, not gonna so embarrass I, me. All right. Well, you 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 flew in. It was in Colorado. I think it was early spring, late winter, and uh, you were driving and giving me the eval at the same time, which I right. since learned not a good idea for me anyway. <laughs> I, I can't multitask that well. Right. But, uh, so you, you call like a troops in contact, you know, had uh, multiple engagements going on at the same time and we were getting out of there. And I remember you, you spun around and um, we hit a a connex like the back of a connex right and the vehicle was fine but it was just enough to shatter the back window right right and, right well continue on with the eval so yeah. that's, that's what happened yeah i remember um because we didn't have anybody we didn't have any targets any moving targets so i was like well i'll just be the target and yeah. uh yeah I, I shoved it in reverse and uh just gunned it and i was gonna do like a some sort of cool J turn or something. And it, it, there was so much ice and snow that I just didn't know. I got no traction at all and just smashed right into that, that Connex. I mean, I thought it was a cool J turn. I've been in the 17th for maybe five minutes. So I, <laughs> right. I was impressed, but I'm pretty sure we had a stiff or, you know, a letter coming out saying, Hey, if you're conducting the eval or you're controlling, you will, you will not be driving the vehicle. So yeah. I think that came out pretty soon after. <laughs> Probably wasn't the best idea. Yeah, but I remember you got out and you were like, you were looking at me like, what do we do now? And I'm like, just keep going. And then I was like, I'll deal with this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious. All right. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, that was, that was the last time we saw each other. That was funny. Um, yeah. So tell me, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. Tell me about like where you, uh, where you grew up, where, what prompted you to join the military, you know, kind of that, uh, so people can get an idea of where you came from and, and where you ended up. Sure, man. Um, so I grew up uh, outside of Augusta, Georgia. If people ask, I church it up and just say Augusta. But it was really Grove Town, um, and it was almost a 400-acre cattle farm um, that my grandparents owned, and my mom and my dad and my sister and I, we lived on that. So I grew up there. Um, you know, it was me, my mom, my dad, my sister, and then uh, parents divorced probably second grade. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that was – you know, that was that I, um, you know, for the most part, it was kind of a weird thing because I grew up on a farm, but at the same time, you know, this part isn't weird, but I played sports, but I also got into like skateboarding and, and punk rock as a kid growing up in Georgia in the, in the mid eighties, yeah. it was kind of an anomaly, you know, growing up on a farm, listening to Merle Haggard and Johnny Cash. And at the same time, listening to like the clash or whatever other band. So it was kind of a weird dichotomy there, but Grew up on a farm, you know, doing standard stuff, you know, between skateboarding and, and sports. And then uh, ended up going to high school in North Georgia, uh, Raven County. Um, not not too, too far from Dahlonega, which I'm sure we've all spent some time up in the Dahlonega area before. But uh, it was that. And then um, ended up going to college in North Carolina, uh, okay. Appalachian State. So I was there for well four years and uh there was no i'd finished my major and my minor um but there was no end in sight like i still had two years left oh. because i had a foreign language requirement to knock out and oh, at this man. point student loans were due um what was your major what were you majoring in <laughs> all right you ready for this sure. so this is an enlisted <laughs> jtac right here man i majored in english literature and minored in philosophy 
So right on. I completed my degree in 20 in O2, but you know, what are we going to do, man? I was so, right. but it, it, it was good. And, uh, but you know, I'd finished that or I was working towards my degree. And then, um, like I said, I had two more years left. Um, and, uh, I remember a buddy of mine, we were at a store one day and we saw our English professor and he was like, that's going to be you, man. And he was no, no offense against anybody selling shoes. He's like, that's going to be you. Cause he was like a business major. I'm like, man, <laughs> he's right. I, I I've got to figure some shit out. So my girlfriend and I, at the time we'd broken up and I'd spent about a year living above a horse barn, taking out trail rides in Banner Elk, North Carolina. So, you know, just being a trail guide on horses. And I was like, I got to figure something out. And uh, so I started looking around, at, you know, different branches of the service. And the plan was to go in the Air Force, do four years, and then come out of the air, you know, finish my degree, and then go to grad school. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know, man, academia. I had, I had no idea. I right, had no. Right. I mean, I'm just floundering, floundering sure. around. But you know, as a kid, I always, you know, like between sports, and then you know, I'm 47. I don't I don't know how old you are, but you know, I grew About up that, in that yeah. culture. Cool, yeah, I grew up in that culture of like, you know, Red Dawn, Rambo, yeah, you know, GI Joe, like all that stuff. You know, I was yeah. always fascinated with it. And my family, my dad didn't serve. But he spent five years in military school, so I always had a huge appreciation for the military. Okay, and you know, both grandparents World War II, um, and I would always like pimp them for stories and yeah. you know, see what see what that's about. So I always had the military was kind of always in the back of my mind, but it just it kind of got lost when I was in college. You know, yeah. and I just I didn't think about it. But um, so I went around, I talked to the Air Force, and I was like, "Hey, here's what I want to do." And keep in mind, this is December. I mean, not December, but this is 98, 99. Okay. And, you know, we weren't at war. Um, right. And uh, I'm like, hey, I want to I want to join. I want to end up finishing my degree and then, you know, do my four years and get out. And they're like, okay, cool. Well, what are you interested in? And I spent my summers doing brakes and oil, um, like, you know, at, uh, at a dealership. So, yeah. like, well, are you mechanical? I'm like, yeah, sure. So, I, I didn't I didn't have a plan. I was right, like, right. All right. like, all right, well. <laughs> Vehicle maintenance. I'm like, sure. And here's a $2,000 bonus. I'm like, sweet. You know, so uh, I ended up joining in December of 99 doing uh, vehicle maintenance. Um, so completed that tech school, Port Wainimi, California. You know, it was cool because we go surfing on the weekends. I mean, it, oh, it yeah. wasn't it wasn't bad. It was, it was a good gig. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, first duty station ended up being McCord you know, air force base out here in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, yeah, started out as, as vehicle guy and, and JD, I'll tell you, it was, I'm glad I went that route because it gave me an appreciation early on in my tack P career to what everybody brings to the fight, you right. know, because what, you know, it, it was like a, eight to five kind of job, you know, you yeah. didn't think about it on the weekends, you know, you're, you're turning wrenches, but you're working hard when you're there, you know, sure. you get like, you get a 15 minute break at 10 and you get a 15 minute break at like 1500 and you get an hour for lunch. You don't get any time for PT. It, it's like a real job where you're punching a time clock. Yeah. So, um, but it gave me a good appreciation for that. And so, and while I was in that, I was able to knock out my degree because my nights were free. Sure. Yeah, so I was able to finish my Spanish out here. So I was able to, to knock that out pretty early. But early on, man, we, uh, you know, September 11th happened. Um, so I will just for ease, ease of purposes, we'll say 2000 ended up, you know, and uh, McCord, like in the spring of 2000. And then, you know, 2001, I mean, it was September 11th, you know, happened and everything changed. I mean, it it got a little more real, like, okay, I'm, I'm in the military. This is, this is for real. This is happening. And then probably five or six months after September 11th, I ended up going over to Afghanistan as a vehicle guy, as an E3, um, to fix the de-icers. Oh, okay. Um, and that was at Bagram. And I don't know, your first trip over there to Bagram, but I mean, you can remember like the old days, man, even, even the air base yeah. was, was the wild west. I mean, there was just blown up MIGs everywhere, IEDs, you know, cluster bombs just scattered all over the place, you know, yep. walk a certain path, 
Oh yeah. You can run along, you can run along Disney, which at that time was a dirt road. Right. Um, right. And there was a village across where the, uh, the airfield was. So it was still pretty surreal for me. Yeah. And I'm an E3 and he, here's, what's funny is I come in, we fly into Bagram, we, we land that night and somehow I ended up on a C-17 with, with a company of Rangers. And so we're coming off the C-17 and we start taking tracer fire. So the C-17, oh, no the crew's freaking out. The Rangers come out, you know, they start pulling security on, on the airfield immediately. And, uh, I'm wheeling my snap on toolbox. It's up to my nose. <laughs> you know, I got all these a bags and yeah. I've got an M 16 with no bullets. And I'm looking <laughs> around at these dudes that are all like high speed, low drag. And I'm yeah. standing there with the toolbox up to my nose and an M 16 <laughs> with no bullets. And I'm like, I'm in the wrong job, man. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I was like this, this, this is not, this is not for me as far as, you know, being a mechanic when I'm seeing guys going out and getting after it. Yeah. yeah. But you know, that, that was a good experience. And I, I was going to the gym, you know, the little tent there near the, uh, the old tower. Um, yeah. and I would see these air force guys come in with modified DCUs, um, and air force name tape and, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, they had M fours and the one knee pad, you know, right, I mean? right. back in the day, you wear the one knee pad. Um, yeah, yeah. So they just come in, do some reps on bench and then get out. I'm looking at these guys and there's just something different about them. I'm yeah. like, Hey man, what do you, what do you, what do you do? Like, what do you guys do? And they're like, we're tack P's. I'm like, what's, what's a tack P? Yeah. And they're like, you see those a tens out there? I'm like, yeah. They're like, well, we, uh, we call it airstrikes. We, we talk to those a tens and we tell them where to drop the bombs. I'm like, really? And I was like, and you guys are in the air force. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> All right, cool, cool. So uh, mm -hmm. I remember, you know, you get like a 10 minute phone call home a week or something like that. So right. I called, uh, I called my wife at the time. I'm like, Hey, um, I'm not going to commission and I'm not going to go to grad school. I'm going to be a TAC P. <laughs> What'd she, she was say? The, she was in the air force. So oh, okay. she knew, she knew, and she's like, are you sure? Because at this point she didn't know anything about like, you know, I was spending all my time like backpacking, fly fishing, you know, free time, you know, doing whatever. And all the while thinking, I'm just going to get out. I'm like, yeah, right. I'm sure. So she had power of attorney and she put in my cross training package. So she did all the work. Really? Yeah. She did all that stuff. Cause <laughs> That's I, was, awesome. I was bored, man. I couldn't even, I didn't really have internet access, you know, right. Right. Early on. So oh, that thing was it. That thing, you're you're right. It was the it was the the surface of the moon out there at, at Bagram. Yeah. There was nothing out there. Yeah, yeah. at the beginning I mean, for sure. We, um, you know, like I said, you get like one phone call a week, and you're in that little cubicle, and right, right, a face to base call. And the operator would patch you through. Um, That's right, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But so and that was even, really and you could only call people that were like, I mean, honestly, we kind of got around it in, in in other ways, but you had to call somebody who was at that base. You know, you could, it was hard to like call somebody who wasn't around a, a, a military installation. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I forgot yeah. about that. So, but I, I remember I was like, yeah, I want to be, I want to be a TAC P. And she's just like, and she worked optometry. So like, she saw TAC P's on the yeah. board and she was like, mm, I don't know if that's for you. I'm like, mm, I'm going to do it. She's like, all right. <laughs> so she, she did the paperwork and submitted it. And uh, when I got back, I had a, a class date for 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 herbie to, nice. to go to tech school so and that was right at you know my that cross training window um, yeah yeah you know first term airman you could go from a critically manned career field to another critically manned career field you know um, right attack p was was critically manned so i was able to to do that but i remember my leadership on the, the vehicle maintenance side were pretty pissed because they put like this time and this effort into me, like they let me finish my degree, you know, I'm going yeah. to school at night and ended up being like the 2002 transportation airman of the year for the entire air force. Oh, really? And it wasn't that I was that good, man. It was just, I could a uh, relatively articulate. I'm probably yeah. not just playing that now. And I was going to school <laughs> and you know, I had deployed. So they had this, like, I was their mom. All those squares right? were filled and you know, all the yeah. squares were filled. Like he's yeah. going to get a commission, you know, this, this is, this is it. And I'm like, Nope, I'm going to reenlist and go be a tech P. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was, that was my time in core, but I'm grateful for that experience just because, for sure. Yeah. You know, deployed early on. I got to see, 
you know, experience the army early on because there wasn't a lot of air force running around. Um, right. and I got to see, you know, not firsthand, but at least get a taste of what that life was like. Yeah. You know? And, um, we did go out into Kabul to buy vehicle parts one time. And on that convoy, I'll never forget it, man. It was like my first time ever doing anything. And I didn't know what I was doing, man. I'm yeah. like, I shot my M16 twice. If you count basic training, but All right. basic training and then qualified. And, uh, one of the vehicles ahead of us, they had like somebody run up and toss a grenade into the vehicle. Oh, and man. so I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is the real deal. So I don't want to say I knew what I was getting into, but I knew I was signing up to go to war. Sure. You know? at that point, um, as far as to be a, to be a TAC P. Yeah, I got back and, uh, then headed down to Herbie and, you know, did tech school. Um, so this is 2004. Um, and I end up pinning E5 in tech school cause I got, you know, below the zone. So I ended up, you know, pinning on, you know, just set for four years as an E5. And nice. that was an interesting story because this was at the time where you had guys that were in for quite a while, you know, before yeah. they would make E5 in the Air Force, because it was like a, you know, 20% promotion rate, you know, right. so you had senior airmen sitting around for like seven years, eight years before they made staff. Yeah. But the year before I saw that they were kind of, they up the, open the aperture, I guess, for guys to make, or uh, to make rank. And I was yeah, like, yeah. well, I need to study because if they're making it easy right now, I need to make rank right now. Because when they make right. it hard, I'm probably not going to make it. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know, I ended up pinning E5 while I was in tech school. And, you know, that was, it was tech school. It was a good time. You know, yeah. I mean, there's nothing, uh, nothing too crazy there. You know, you have your, I like to call you get your couple cup of Jesus moments while you're there. Um, right. I remember uh, I struggled with the plugger. Okay. In tech school because we had a guy who had to go to legal and I was the class leader. And, um, while we were doing the, uh, they were doing the plugger class. I missed the class because I had oh. to take this kid to legal. So the first time I saw the plugger was in the field. Oh my God. And yeah, man, th that didn't, that didn't go down too well. So I, I, I yeah. had to, I had to redo the, the plugger piece, but, uh, yeah, because yeah, it's, it's not super intuitive. I mean, it, it, a little bit, but it's if you miss the whole thing, then you're just like starting from scratch. So, right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm trying to learn it like day two or day three in the field. And I'm like, <laughs> man. man, I've never even picked this thing up before. And they're like, haven't you had the class? I'm like, no, I had to take whatever over to legal. So, yeah. <laughs> they cut and you some then, slack or did they were they like. They did. Out. They did. Yeah. But I got fired, which was fine by me because I was yeah. a class leader. Finally, I'm not the class leader anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, you know, I've been the class leader up to this point to the field portion. Like, good. So, yeah, it seems like that'd be a good deal. Like, you want to be in charge, but man, it's just like you're already trying to, to navigate your way through this course. But then now you got now you're responsible for everybody and yourself. It's like, it's, right. yeah, it's just that added pressure. So, and, and, you know, I'll be honest, it's the first time when you experience that sleep deprivation, you know, yeah. what I mean? like I'd never experienced, you know, five, Same. Of, yeah. you know, not being able to get a lot of sleep. And I, I realized like, this is something, this is something I got to work on. This yeah. is not, this isn't good because I'm not right. doing well right now. I'm not <laughs> performing. So, uh, but yeah, so graduated tech school and I ended up going to Carson. Um, okay. which that was an 04 and they had just come back third ACR had deployed. And I think it was, I think it was three BCT. I think that's what it was. So they had just gotten back. So all these guys had deployed already yeah. during OIF one and, and JD, it was, it was a phenomenal unit, man. So I get to Carson, but what's funny is my wife and I, we, we drove into town like like on a Friday, like at 10. So we check right. into a hotel and dude, I'm, I'm motivated. Like I don't have to show up until Monday, but right. I'm ready. So I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I'm sitting there, I'm looking around, we're in this hotel room, um, which we got Carson. She was able to do a kind of a drug deal for us to go to Colorado because she knew oh. people in like assignments. So nice. Like, Let's go to Colorado. Um, so I go, I show up to the unit and you know motivated i'm in my blues uh it's a <laughs> friday afternoon probably around like 1400 and uh I, I walk in to the unit 
and nobody's there except there's these uh, two, uh, we'll just call them chubby muscular E7s. Okay. Um, and they're looking at me and, and they're like, okay, uh, are you, uh, you cross trained? I'm like, Roger Sergeant, you know, I'm at parade rest. I'm in my blues, you know, back in the day. But first of all, blues. when you said your blues, I'm like, what's going on? What are you doing? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know any different, you know I mean? That's, that's how I was told to report into your unit. You know, you show that's up hilarious. Blues, you know, looking, yeah. looking sharp and, uh, I'm at parade rest, you know, there's two master sergeants who are sitting down they don't get up to shake my hand. They just kind of right. Like, or whatever and and dude i'm not gonna lie these these dudes weren't at the tip of the spear they've kind of been put out in the pasture and they're like you're a cross trainee i'm like roger sergeant and I'm like mm, just so you know cross trainees don't do well in this career field and i'm they thinking, haven't been in, they have not been in the 17th obviously they're, yeah, man that, and, yeah and, and i'm thinking what have i done like these guys don't even want me. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. <laughs> so I remember I went back to a hotel room and I told you know my wife at the time, I was like, I think I fucked up. And oh, she's man. just like, What? <laughs> so she's furious, but you know, we, we worked it out and uh you know Yeah, so, she was already telling you in the beginning, like, Are you sure this is for you? Are you sure? Know. And then I yeah. come back and I'm like, uh, I don't know if I made the right call. <laughs> you know? Oh man. Because you know, I'm judging ex you know, appearances too, man. You know, I'm for sure runner and shape. You know, yeah, yeah. always worked out and, you know, you got these two guys that are just like not impressive. Right. Um, right. But then that, that Monday rolled around, man. And we had that first PT session and it was, it was just a phenomenal unit. Um, you know, I, I, I'm probably going to forget some names here, but I'm just going to throw some out. Sean Mignon, yeah. um, Nishimoto, Dave uh, yeah. Bickle, Brett Barbie, Kyle McSherry, um, William Shepard, great uh, guys. Eddie Ramirez, oh, okay. Alex yeah. Royal, Adam Brumback. Okay, those are nine dudes right now that I can that went to the soft side from that yeah. unit. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and I know I'm forgetting. Uh, and all those guys are stellar for sure. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, great just, guys. Just it, it was that kind of unit. And yeah, I'll be honest, man. We had our leadership was just so good. I mean, you had. You know, Sean, who was over on the soft side um, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, I think it was like Billy Bergram, a couple other guys that I, I didn't really know. I didn't really get to know those dudes. Nishimoto had come from the schoolhouse. Okay. He was over there. So, you know, we had that influence of the dudes over at 10th group were still coming over and they were inviting motivated guys to come over and train. Nice. And then we also had Airburst, which was our backyard. Yeah. Um, and we had an F-16 squadron out of Aurora, Colorado, which I think they're still going. And then there was another one out of maybe Albuquerque, New Mexico. There was some 16s out of somewhere out of New Mexico. Okay. So we would get both units coming in um, for training. Man. And it was literally like, hey, do you want to go out on air this week? I'm like, yeah. You know, <laughs> right. Um, so and it was every week. It felt like we had air. So that yeah, was yeah. that was awesome. And we trained hard. I mean, there, there was some other leadership like JJ little, um, yep, that, yep. you know, you knew he was a prior army guy right? and their mindset was definitely wired for like, you know, train hard. Um, yep. and then, you know, airburst was phenomenal because it was one of those ranges where they're like, Hey man, we're here for you. What, what do you want? What do you guys want to do? So, you know, yeah. they built up villages and it was great. And yeah, that's great. That is, that's a great range. I mean, that's it, a nice urban, it's kind of an urban type. From what I remember, more of an urban yeah. Uh, yeah. range. Yeah, it was good. There were some of the earlier, it was one of the earlier places where they did that. And, you know, there's something about being in Colorado too, where there's just a, like a fitness mindset. Right. Because it's, everybody's doing something on the weekends. You're either in the mountains, you know, backpacking, hiking, snowboarding, skiing, backcountry skiing, climbing, mountaineering. Right, right. Um, it's just the outdoor mindset. And the entire unit had that. I mean... And, you know, we would do for squadron PT, we would go to a 14er, you know, not just Pikes Peak, which is right there in our backyard, but we yeah. would go, you know, the Sangre de Cristos, San Juans were a pretty, pretty far stretch, but, you know, you know, the front range and the Sangre de Cristos, we would, you know, squadron events, you know, yeah. we'd go to a 14er. So it was That's just a cool. great place to grow up and to, to get, uh, you know, to get some, you know, your training and early experience and, and mentorship. You know, yep. from, from,
from these guys that had, you know, deployed and done it. I remember, you know, Brett and Kyle McSherry were some of the early guys that had deployed to Afghanistan with the Brits and, you know, oh, okay. that, you know, British Royal Marine, you know, combat patch. I'm like, man, what is that? You know, you that's know, cool. That pick in their brain. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was, that was, that was great. Um, I learned early on though, like tack P you know, being at E5 and when I came through, like on the vehicle pipeline, you know, it, it followed, what is it, your, your 797s, you know, like hey, where you're- Yeah, like your, that, your training records. Yeah, your training records. Like yeah. for that on vehicle, on the vehicle side, they pair you with a mechanic to get this qualification, this qualification. I learned, it took me, you know, probably three to six months was like, if you're going to learn in this job as a TAC P though, I, and our training, pipeline was a little different, you know, the OJT piece, mm -hmm. um, at least in Colorado, you, you got to go want it. You've got to go get it. You've got to yeah. seek it out. And then those guys knew that, you know, they just want to share their knowledge and they want, they want you to train. So yeah, I was pretty motivated from day one. Um, like when I saw Sean and those guys, I, I knew, um, I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. I, yeah. I want to be a soft tech P like there's, and that's, that's what I'm going to do. Right. So, um, but yeah, so it was there. And then um, that led into my first deployment as a TAC P. And um, that was the third ACR. Okay. Um, and we initially went into Baghdad. And I don't know what they were going to do with an armor unit in Baghdad, but that's, you know, we were there. And I think, yeah. I think we were there maybe two weeks. And then they had us push north to Talafar or Talafar, depending on you know who you yep. ask. Right. Um, so we were there in Baghdad. We made that push up north and you know established you know our, ourselves in, in Talafar there. And that was, dude, I'll, I'll tell you that that was a great deployment. I was pretty bummed because you know I was just a, I was a romad at the time. Um, right. You know I hadn't even been in a year, and uh, maybe r just close to being a year. Um, okay. We deployed. So, but I was with uh, a guy named William Trombull, who was a prior radio guy for like 10 years. And he okay. spent time with TAC P's and CCT's. You know, he'd always done, you know, he's a comm dude, but he'd always done like, you know, kind of the combat comm area, yeah. you know, working in that area. So, just a wealth of knowledge, man. I mean, like, learned so much from him. And, he, you know, he was smooth on the radio, he'd just been around it. So once again, you're just soaking, just soaking everything in. But yeah. when we got there, you know, we were, I was basically at brigade trauma. Okay. And, were. and um, so I was bummed, you know, yeah. realizing, Hey man, we're, we're not going to be able to get after it. But then we were stacked pretty heavy at brigade and the, they had done something unique. Third ACR did Colonel McMaster's um, he now general retired. Um, he, because they had an aviation component directly assigned to them, they stood up a ground troop that was going to be assigned to an aviation unit. Oh, okay. Um, so they kind of like pulled dudes from, you know, throughout the, uh, third ACR to stand up this kind of pseudo battalion. I mean, it was more like, it was like a company. It was less than a company. Okay. And so our whole job, you know, cause Talafer's up in Northern Iraq was was basically to patrol the border and keep people from border you know crossing the borders and making sure the border forts were were you know squared away so sometimes man i mean my nights we would go out for two weeks at a time um and just hang out on the border and uh you know come back spend three or four days refit or maybe maybe a little more you know just depending and then yeah. just go back out there on the border out of no man's land so you, you know you're running amok with a, a young captain, you know, who's in <laughs> right. charge and just, just having a blast, man. And it was, um, you know, I spent a lot of time sitting in the vehicle with a pallet at night, talking to J stars, you know, just looking for movers. Cause if yeah. they could, you know, get their little dots and you get somebody crossing the border, then we would just rally. And then we'd all, you know, have aviation like Apaches just at our, at our command. So yeah. You know, we'd get people crossing the border and then um, we would, you know, call up 
the uh, callback to brigade there to the talk, and then they would launch Apaches, and then we would go interdict them. You know, either you know, depending on what it was, you know, it was as right. simple as you know, we would pull the the vehicle over, or depending on the size of the convoy and whatever intel was supporting it. You know, we would end up hitting it with Apaches, and so because it was rotary wing, you know, Trombull would would let me take some of those controls. Nice. For the rotary wing piece. So that that was that was awesome, man, and it was a good time, and even even back when we were back, if we had movers or we were getting word that, you know, people were crossing the Syrian border into Iraq, you know, we had Blackhawks. So then we would do like vehicle interdictions and we trained on vehicle interdictions, um, Nice, you know, and I, I don't know where they were getting their, their TTPs, TTPs from, you know, like when I got <laughs> to the 17th and, you know, you, you learned those TTPs, it was close. It wasn't dead on, but it was close. Right. <laughs> um, they're so doing their was, best. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, yeah. But it was just, it was just an awesome experience, man. Yeah. And I had a, a great deployment and what I learned there from, from Trombull was, I mean, if you want to be employed by the army, then you need to be with the army. Right. You know, there's no like hanging out in your chew, you know, if we're not, you know, even if we're, we're back in the rear, we're going to be in the talk, yeah. you know, we're going to be in the talk, pulling that talk time and, and that face time. So, um, that's, you know, just, just a great experience there of, of getting that and learning early on of, of how to integrate and being with somebody who has the right mindset, who's leaning yeah. forward. Um, well, that helps. I mean, if you get a guy who's like, just looking to skate, it can really dampen your experience, you know I mean? And, and like you said, the army will either forget about you or they'll curse you because you're not there, but one of the, either way is bad. So if you're, you got to be there yeah. to like, you know, expose yourself to them and tell them what you can do, you know, and, and frankly, provide them the, the correct guidance to employ that, those kind of assets. So, yeah. Yeah. You got to yeah. be there for sure. Yeah. So, and that, that was a great lesson. And I definitely took that, you know, into my next rotation. Um, yeah. Yeah. So did, did that deployment, um, came back to Carson, um, and probably that was the OIF two. Yeah, OF2, OF2 going into OIF3, and then it ended up okay. like a seven, seven month deployment. And that was back in the day where, you know, you had your six months and then you get extended 30 days. And yeah. you're just like, oh my God, we're getting extended 30 days. <laughs> right. All the army's doing a year, you know? Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, or at least a year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, this is before stop loss. And so that, that whole story comes later, man, where it's just like my empathy is just just huge for these guys. oh yeah I, mean, I got a guy at work he did like a, i want to say 16 or 17 months you know just straight iraq time i was like i can't even imagine what yeah. he went through yeah it's yeah. crazy so but uh come back uh to carson and then um end up redeploying and now you're no longer you're not really deploying because things are ramping up you got afghanistan and you've got iraq and so this will be going into my third deployment, my second deployment as a TAC P, um, yeah. and I was with still with third ACR, but they had stood up this these they had the guys that were airborne qualified, and I was one of them, and they had this like they called it like the quick strike troop or whatever, and so basically yeah. you just get farmed out to whoever needs a JTAC team. So um, I was with Alexander Royal, Alex Royal, who okay. 175 guy, phenomenal dude. He was yeah. he was my airman. He was an A1C at the time. Wow. And so we deployed, um, you know, I'm an E5, I'm a JTAC. And so we end up deploying with 101st. And once again, man, I end up at, we're, we're at Brigade, yeah. you know, and these guys are like, you know, they were getting what they're calling an augmentee because, you know, we weren't in the, what is it? The, is it the 19th that's out of Campbell? Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's the 19th, you know, we weren't in the 19th. They saw us, we were an unknown entity and we get there and they're like, yeah, comms have been crappy in the jock. We, we haven't been able to, you know, comms have been bad. We don't know what's going on. We think it's jammers. I'm like, all right. So I'm, I look at Royal. I'm like, Hey man, check it out. We're going to fix this. And so we, we basically, you know, I had him climb the little little tower, um, and we took the UHF antenna because this is what my 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 JTAC did right. back in the day. We took the UHF antenna off of the Humvee and ran it up the mast that was behind the brigade talk there, 
and you know ran the wire and plugged it into yeah. our, our 117 and lo and behold man we, we've got comms nice you know what i mean and they're like oh wow you guys fixed it we've been here like 30 days with bad comms and <laughs> so they you're I a guess, hero yeah and so like just that little bit of effort you know yeah. um they ended up taking us that they'd had some issues with the dudes out at battalion that were working out of like fob justice there in baghdad mm -hmm. so they're like hey man we've got we're having some issues with these two dudes i think we're going to pull them back to brigade and we're going to push you and royal down there i'm like nice. sweet so yeah. royal and i are, are pretty pumped so we end up going to to justice and um dude once again man that, that was a it was a great experience you know i i'll be honest with the third acr you know we experienced ticks you know but it's armor and we were traveling around in humvees so yeah. you know we were getting shot at we were pushing through the city you know what i mean right. we were just pushing through um and you know there were some real battles in talafar but you know i was hanging out on the syrian border like when they did the clearance of talafar or talafar it was um you know textbook perfect um, yeah but you know we were catching guys either fleeing into syria are coming from Syria, you know, smuggling okay. weapons in from Syria. So I wasn't part of that, you know, piece where, you know, if I'd been shot at, it was in a vehicle, you're buttoned up. It's, it's yeah. just a different experience. But so Royal and I go forward and it was first of the 502nd. And, and these guys were, um, the, this is where like we were living, you know, with the company, um, open bay bunk bed dudes yeah. hacking and coughing at night like just you know staying up to like <laughs> three in the morning and like and, and you know we're, we're doing talk shifts you know we're, we're hanging right, out right. you know and uh we're like this is this isn't gonna work so <laughs> we ended up getting moved but these guys had already done a year deployed they yeah. got extended on that deployment so they Jeez. ended up doing like 15 months See, they that's what I'm talking home, about. That's crazy. Yeah, they came home for nine months. They didn't even get a full year home. They redeployed. And then while they're deployed early on, they find out that they're going to be extended. They're going to go 15 months. And this Jeez. is, uh, yeah, this is during the surge. This is probably, so my son was born in 2006. This is probably like 07, because remember, he was like a year and a half, two years old. Yeah. And uh, so like, they're 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 done man i mean they're just their morale is just in the tank and so you got guys stopped and that's off. why you shouldn't do that to these guys i mean i, I always I, I i don't know i'll tell anybody who will listen that the army leadership they're great most of the time but those particular decisions they make where they extend guys like that is i don't i can't see the i don't see i i understand it saves money and it's probably a lot easier for them but man you got guys that are like burnt out like you were saying i mean it doesn't make any sense to me yeah. i it, as a mission focus, it doesn't make sense. Everything else, it, it makes sense. Yeah, logistically, monetarily, that kind of thing. But yeah, anyway, yeah, sorry. I mean, it but just, it's the a human element money. piece, man. It's, at some point, these these dudes break, and and the right. apathy that it said. And when I say apathy, it's not like they weren't getting after it. It's just yeah. their mindset. There, there's sure. something that happens to them where they just they just don't care. When I right. say they don't care, like it, you know, they get shot at. Then it's just it's game on you know what i mean yeah yeah and and it was a weird time in iraq too because it was during the surge um but there were moments of nothing like nothing was happening and yeah. then it ramp up and then it gets super intense and then you'd have nothing yeah. so like the roe was so it was it would get super restrictive and then it would open up it gets super restrictive and then it would open up and, and you can't it's hard to do that to folks, man, when they're oh, just yeah. out every single day. And I'll tell you, like, I'm not trying to, to toot my own horn or sound cool because I look back on it and it was ridiculous. This is also during the time of I, you, you were in the 17th then. So, um, but, you know, th there were th these things called like outside the wire worksheets, you know, where you had to yeah. fill out this worksheet to justify your mission. Well, you know, I'm seeing these guys, Roland and I are seeing these guys and, you know, with the big army man route, if a route was green, you know how that route was green? Yeah. The scouts would drive that route. Crazy. And if the scouts didn't get blown up, then the route was green. Oh man. Yeah. And 
you know, Royal and I were volunteering to go out on these, you know, route clearance ops with the scouts and looking back, I'm like, man, that that's the most dangerous thing I ever did because oh. this is at the time where EFPs, you know, came on or were coming in country and, and the only saving grace with the EFP was that, well, if we get hit with an EFP, we know there's not a lot of suffering. You're, you're going to be done. Right. You know what yeah, I mean? You'll be you're, obliterated. Be so I remember like there being a mindset shift in my head too, like that kind of stuck with me throughout the rest of my career. You know, I, I didn't want to die. I didn't, you know, but like there was this, you put this away and if it happens, it happens. And it, it's yeah. kind of like, it makes it hard to plan for the future when you're like, man, I, I, I don't know if we're going to make it through this, you know, this mission, but I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. yeah and just kind of compartmentalize the, the fear aspect of it. And it doesn't even come into the, the equation come anymore. Into play. And, and you yeah. stop, I stopped like really managing and planning for the future because I'm like, I'm probably not going to make it, man. You can only roll the dice so many times, you know? Right. Right. Um, but that, that unit was really good. There was a guy there, uh, major Tackett and he had spent time at 175 as I think he was a company commander. Okay. And, um, he, you know, he knew Kevin Vance, he knew Lundquist, he knew like all of these guys from 175. So because he had spent time at battalion, he knew how to employ his JTACs. Nice. So what he did with us is he would farm us out to the, the whatever company was the main effort, yeah. um, you know, for, for operations. Um, and then we would go forward and support that company. And at that time there weren't on the conventional side, there weren't a lot of tech P's going out forward. They were doing most of their controlling from the jock. Yeah. And it was, but once again, this was one of those deals where I was trained. You're there to support the army. You're there to work. Right. And my leadership at brigade at, at the 19th, and I'm not going to say their names. I did end up seeing one of the guys later on. He ended up getting his commission. He was an E6 okay. at the time. And I'm like, oh, wow, you're an officer now. <laughs> he told Royal and I to stop being so motivated to just kick our feet up and, and just and relax. I'm like, man. I can't do that, man. These guys are going out every single day. Yeah. Um, and he's like, yeah, the war's over. What? Okay. But, um, so we were there and, and like, like I said, major Tackett knew how to employ his J tax. And there was a little bit of a fight about us going forward. And yeah. he's like, give me the number. So you got this prior Ranger company commander who's calling <laughs> up the brigade. And he, the next day he comes in, he's like, you guys are good. You got nothing to worry about. I'm nice. Like, All right, sweet. So, you know, from, from there on, it was just like a blank sheet of paper. You know, we, we were being employed. Uh, what, what I view is, is, is properly. I mean, we were just there with the army getting after it. And, you know, that was, that was a good, a good trip. I, in the sense that a lot of controlling, you know, um, got to do the job, felt validated, you know, yeah. a new JTAC. I got to, you know, say cleared hot. I remember I was controlling Apaches instead of giving them like a five line, you know, um, I was like, I'm giving them a nine line. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so Royals, you know, were there, but you know, so that was like, as a JTAC, that was my, my first, you know, cleared hot, you know, now I know everybody, oh, everybody a case of beer, but yeah. you know, it, it was so weird. Like I said, it would get strict and then it would loosen up. It would get strict and loosen up and, and Royal, you know, we were in a tick one time and he looks at me and he was like, can I shoot back? And, it's and crazy. I'm not insulting Royal. No, I know. Like, this, not this at all. No, it's, I, for it, sure. It, not it's at all. Legit right. Question. I'm like, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, absolutely. And um, which is kind of the inherent problem, like kind of you alluded to, you know, the, the, when you change the ROE so much, it, you know, it's it's hard for these guys. They don't want to they don't want to do the wrong thing. They're young. You know, they're they're they question what they should be doing. It's that. And that's the danger of, of changing it so much. It's like, look, yeah. Yeah, inherently in, in them, it should be if you get shot at return fire that should be just like an automatic you know yeah. kind of a thing they do but yeah no yeah. no hit on him by any no, means and, sure. and it wasn't and and even for me man this was one of those I, I think i think everybody has it you know it was one of those surreal moments like i was talking about that other deployment you know where you're pushing you know it's pushing through vehicles getting shot at but you're, you're in a vehicle man you're buttoned up in right. a vehicle and you know now we're on like you know we're on foot patrols and you're getting shot at and i remember thinking to myself 
and it, it's kind of embarrassing, but I'm like, Oh, that's what it's like to get shot at, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. and you know, it's just kind of like a surreal thing. And, and, you know, you, you go and you take cover and you lean against the wall. You're like, Oh, don't lean against the wall. Bullets fall walls, come off the wall. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. those, those, those little things that you're trained with, you know, start kicking in. Um, but I do remember like that first firefight you're like, Oh, that's what it's like to be shot at. You Makes know? it a little more real. Yeah, it does. It does. But, and that was, like I said, that was for, for, for myself and for, I think for Royal, it was, a, I don't, it wasn't really an introduction, but it was working with, you know, it's the 101st man. There's a legacy there. It's first yeah. to 502nd. There's a legacy there. Um, right. Uh, and they had, you know, some good leadership and they had some great dudes, uh, that were there. And, um, but it, 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 that, that thirst and that taste, you know, I ended up coming back off of that deployment and I put in my application while I was there, um, for, to, to go to selection and you know, for the, for the, it wasn't the 17th then it was to go over to the soft side. Um, yeah. So Cause those guys weren't yet. OLs yet of the right. 17th. Well, we were yeah. OLs, but we hadn't fallen under the 17th yet. We're still, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Still been under, I was trying to go over to OLD or anywhere for that. Matter. Right. Right. And, um, it didn't matter, you know, if it, where, and honestly, JT, I didn't know the difference between like SF and Ranger. You know, yeah, yeah. like I, I didn't, I, I honestly, I had a lot I of guys Rangers, don't. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Rangers on that first trip to Afghanistan and that was it. Yeah. And then, but I was working, you know, with Mignon and, and Barbie oh, sure. and Nishimoto yep. and Bickle and Ostroskis and, you know, those guys up at OLD. All heavy hitters. I mean, all yeah, just yeah. stellar guys. Yeah. And, and, you know, they were taking the time to, to train us and pass that knowledge on. But, you know, I put in my packet and, you know, Major Tackett wrote me a, you know, great review and you know so i came back from that deployment and uh went through like our our selection that they had put on um so you know it was like 12 mile rough march pt test go to the range control you know that, that whole bit and so nice. got picked up to go over to old so i had nice. know, support and 10th group there um so at this point you know I'm, i've i've now come over to the soft side and still don't know anything about it. You know, right. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it, you know, it's like this. Yeah. You're right. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's awesome because Royal ended up going to 17th selection like a year okay. or two later nice. when he became a JTAC and he got picked up and based off of that deployment, he got like one of the 12 outstanding airmen of the year. So nice. I felt good as a, as a leader that, you know, Hey man, my Romad is getting recognized for his efforts. So that was, that was, that was pretty gratifying to see him succeed oh, and then for, sure. for me to get picked up to go over the 17th or to the soft side. And yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So now I'm, you know, still at Carson ended up spending seven years there. And then, um, that first trip, you know, we were still, under the 13th, but soon after, probably like six months later, um, we ended up becoming not even six months. We ended up falling under the 17th ASOS. Okay. Um, which is, you know, obviously now it's the 17th STS. So that was, that was, you know, it, it wasn't, I didn't feel like I had made it, but like this is, this was my goal as a tech. Yeah. You know, it wasn't to make rank. It wasn't to do this, you know, to do whatever it was. I want to get over on the soft side and experience yeah. that time. And I had seen ODAs before. I mean, like I was that guy that I remember on that first trip with third ACR, I saw a minigun for the first time, mounted on a Humvee. Right. And I'm coming out of the chow hall. And I'm like, holy shit. You know, the, <laughs> what is that? And so I go That's over so to the guys. Cool. I'm like, hey, man, is, is that a minigun? And they're like, yeah, dude. You know, they're, you know, like, yeah, dude, right, yeah. Is, is it awesome? They're like, it's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm like, wow. You know what I mean? So I, I was that guy that would just go, you know, kind of talk to anybody, you know? Yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, we get over there and then, you know, probably, you know, three months later, you know, we fall into 17th day sauce and, uh, that was, you know, just, it was, it was, it was, it was eye opening because now I'm seeing that I'm starting to see what Ranger's doing too. A little yeah. bit. I'm hearing snippets. It's still, man, like even back then on, the, you know, the SF side and the Ranger side, even if you're attack P there, it, it's not intentional, but there's still that little bit of like 
Ranger SF, you know, rivalry. And I didn't even know that rivalry existed, man. I'm like a golden retriever wagging my tail. I'm just happy to be here guys. You know, like, right, right. (laughs) put me the game. What, what what game? I'll I'll play whatever game you want to play, man. I'm I'm just happy to be here. Um, but yeah, so then, uh, you know, it's with 10th group and then go down to, to binning and that was the jump week. And that was probably the, fr- I didn't meet you on that trip, but I remember, uh, do you remember that, uh, it was a jump. We had like two or three days of jumping that we were sharing lift with UH ones with the Marines. Yeah. Yeah. And the Marines, they had all those guys that ended up in the trees right? And, and yeah, past, and they had their Cypress fired early because they didn't reset their Cypress. And I don't know any of this, man. I'm static line. I've probably had like nine jumps at this point. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, but it was myself and, and Macias, we were brand new hires. And, uh, we, we were, were we at Arkman? Was that the yeah. Arkman? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was an Arkman. And Cause that's that a tight, was... it's, it's good. It's big enough, but it, if you don't pay attention or you don't do the right thing, you can get in some serious troubles. <laughs> yeah. Quick. yeah. We were good. Like, but we were, we were sharing the UH ones with the Marines, but we yeah. weren't jumping with the Marines, you know, it was right, like right. we were alternating sticks yeah. and you know, they had guys that ended up in the trees and <laughs> we did have one, uh, one of the, uh, one of the ALOs. I'm not going to call them out here, but it's a famous picture, man. When I went to jump master school, you know, like they talk about that vigorous, you know, Oh, I know exactly was, what you're going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when he's hung up on the, yep, yep. on the skid of the UH one, so, uh, and then, yeah, that, that could, I mean, you can say that it was hit. I mean, I, it, it's debatable. He should have definitely kind, kind of got up and out a little farther, but I think we actually forgot to tape that piece. Like there was a, there's a little piece on the front of a UH one. It's like a little, I don't know if it's a comp port or whatever it is, but yeah, he, he hooked his, the saddle of his, um, of his uh, harness on that little piece. And uh, yeah. we should have probably taped it up a little better, I think, but. <laughs> yeah that was hilarious yeah dude, that, that was, was a cool. real kind of an emergency because i don't think because he was he was low enough because we had to bring him down because we couldn't kick him off i mean i guess they could have went to the altitude but we just couldn't reach him he was too far forward and uh yeah we had to bring him down and if he would have fell off like any time in that descent it could have been really bad because the static line wouldn't have wouldn't have deployed a shooting time to get him any lift so yeah, it was, yeah, was kind of hairy I, I i just remember seeing him like he got lower like he came they they brought him down with that's what i mean like had had he uh like if he would have fell off during that descent of the aircraft it it could could have been bad yeah yeah Yeah. so but do you uh, have that picture we we were all looking for that picture i can't find it anywhere i don't i can find it i mean i can get i don't have the picture but but jd it's an you know it was in my static line jump master course oh really it's even in my free it's like the first slide when you when you show up you know oh that's awesome to the combat control school jump master course it's right there so <laughs> i'm great. not gonna call a dude out um but yeah it was he's he's famous for that he's yeah he's, every jump master course at ccs they show that picture <laughs> <laughs> hilarious but yeah we were, i was there and i remember macias and i were just like what is what's going on like because then we see the marines in the trees and you know we've been yeah. in the 17th like a week Point, right you, know? you saw like every everything that could go wrong with a jump you saw it like that first week. yeah but i also saw you like tandem somebody in you know what i mean no and, i wasn't not, i wasn't tandem qualified oh, wasn't you okay it wasn't but, me yeah all right i think but i think it was your team that was out there that they could have been yeah they brought somebody in yeah, yeah and you know once again i'm seeing guys that are running around with beards i'm like who are those guys like don't right. worry about that don't don't worry about <laughs> that okay you know and it was like the same deal. I remember seeing Tommy Case when I was at the the 13th, you know, still sporting third ACR. And he comes out and, you know, he's got his beard, like a little mullet, you know. Um, right. And uh, I'm like, who are these guys? They're like, don't worry about who those guys are. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you, know? but, you should be uh, worrying. You should be like getting information. And, you know, that's, well, uh, you know. That was kind of the, the problem, I think, on the Ranger side. And we've always done it. We've always, yeah. done, we've always been so closed knit, you know, not close knit, yeah. but just tight lipped because Ranger is so tight. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to get anything away and then have Ranger be like, Hey, what the hell what are you talking about? And it's right. like, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, but yeah, so that was that first trip. And and that's when I started realizing too, like you had the SF side and you had the Ranger side. 
and they mixed because they might have been at Bragg together a little bit. But, yeah. you know, and like I said, man, I was like a golden retriever wagging my tail. I'm like, right. whatever, dude. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Cam Rollison. I'm Rollo. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, uh, yeah, dude. So that that was, you know, while I was, at, you know, over at uh, Tenth Group, you know, deployed out of there. But I never deployed with Tenth Group support while we were there. Oh, right. going to ranger school while I was there as well. So I look back on oh, that okay. time frame, man, and it was just like deploy ranger school, which, you know, I did so well at, at the, at, at phase one, they kept me. So for, <laughs> you know, to, to redo, uh, Darby. Yeah. So I, I, I recycled Darby. So I was in range and I did pre ranger. So that was, man. that was a deployment, you know, yeah, and yeah. then I come back for, you know, a few months and deploy, but so deployed with fifth group, um, to Basra, uh, Iraq. Okay. And that, yeah. Tell me about that. I, I see. I'm always fascinated. Uh, I don't, I don't hear enough about the SF side, you know, I've done all Ranger stuff and I, yeah. I love hearing about the SF deployments. Cause it's so it's, we shared a, some safe houses with some SF guys sometimes, but usually I didn't get a whole lot of information. So yeah, please tell me how that went. Yeah, dude, it, it was, it was one of those deals where, you know, I, been in the 17th, maybe seven, eight months, did it, did a couple PMTs, uh, did some train ups. But the thing that, that I, that I struggled with, I didn't, I, I didn't struggle with it because as a JTAC, you know, you kind of got to be that chameleon. You got to be able to fit in with whoever you're with. Right. Um, but you know, I, I got to, you know, train with 10th group, but never deployed with 10th group. So yeah. once again, it's kind of like, the bucket system we need we're filling bodies man we're, we're putting people here oh right. he's he's soft he's gonna go here so um ended up going to basra iraq and dude that was i hit the ground running i remember i flew in they got me a quick quick flight from from biop down to basra and i show up it's dark and they're like hey dude we got a mission i'm like God. <laughs> okay. All right. Like, dude, I didn't have fills. Like I just, I'm like, I'm off the bird. You know what I mean? You know, my weapon yeah, was yeah. zero eyes before I left, but you know, I haven't confirmed my zero, you know what I mean? I confirmed it before I left, Yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? But you know, it should be good. It should be good. You know, hopefully. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm, I hit the ground run. Like, Hey man, we got a mission, you know, we, we got something kicking off here in the next two hours. I'm like, all right, dude, give me fills. So I sat with the, the, the echo, fill my radios. I run in, Jock it up, um, doing up uh, GRGs, put in my request, and you know I ended up getting, you know, you know three or four different assets, which was pretty good, you know, for, yeah, yeah. for that. You know, we weren't a tick, we weren't a tick, and it was what was awesome about this is that like first night, you know, it's kind of trial by fire, man. You you either gonna figure it out or you're not. You know, it was like right, oh, right. Ready. It was like, well, get me fills and you will have a JTAC. You know what I mean? So fill my radios, do up a quick GRG of the target area, uh, put in my, you know, 1972, what was even 1972? I forget, forget what we were using, but, uh, our, our equivalent then yeah, yeah. I would fill it. And, uh, so we drive out and we were with, um, I the Iraqi special operations forces. So we had the Iraqi commandos with fifth. Group. Okay. Um, and uh, so we're going out this night, man, and they get turned around. There's some barricades and they can't get through the barricades. And I'm like, I got this. So I have the aircraft. I'm like, hey, man, you, you've got our position. You know where you're going. I was like, give us a talk on. So like, all right. And, you know, this it wasn't like IR tight. You know what I mean? So I basically had to yeah. put down a sparkle and we just followed the sparkle <laughs> to the target building. And, nice. Uh, and so we went there and, you know, we, we were jackpot that first night. So like nice. it, it worked out, got to be the hero, you know, because they got lost and I was able <laughs> to use, use the, uh, use the assets to get us talked onto the target building and, you know, they ended up getting yeah. jackpot. So that nice. was a good way to start out the rotation. And those dudes were, it was good, man. But I'm once again, you know, your aperture is only this big, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not seeing, it's like that, you know, first 20 jumps in free fall school. Right, um, right. I didn't even know that they had this whole other like, you know, a sock or a sought side, you know, where they're doing like, you know, their, their surrogate stuff and their sneaky peek thing They had yeah. literally had a curtain and it was like two different teams. Yep. Um, I, I didn't know what they did. They never shared anything with us. 
other than, you know, the targets. But, uh, you know, on that trip, it was, it was really, I think what I learned, what helped reinforce that whole thing for me was like, okay, even though you're a 12 man ODA, you still need the army. Like yeah. if you're in a bad way, you still need the army. So like they would go coordinate with the big army for QRF and I would go over and it was the Brits that were okay. working out of there. And so I would coordinate with the Brits out of their, their talk. I'm like, Hey man, you're going to see this call sign. You know, this is my name. This is where I am. And it was just really about building relationships. Like, yeah. you know, I would go with the, the Bravo, you know, cause we needed parts for weapons and so we would go to like the main armor for whatever, I think it was like maybe 10th mountain. I don't remember who was there at the time, but you know, we would need parts from their, their armor. And, okay. you know, once again, he was like, Hey man, you ever shot a minigun? And he's like, no, I've never shot a minigun talking to this dude. And yeah, he's yeah. like, well, you know what? We'll bring you over to our compound and we'll let you shoot the minigun. And lo and behold, from that point on, if we ever needed anything from those guys, it's, you know, it was, it was there. So I learned a lot about building relationships. Oh, on yeah. that side and that hey man it, it doesn't matter where you are we're all here for for you know the same purpose but but that's kind of like the sf mission is to win hearts and minds and kind of massage guys to get what you need and give them a little bit and get a lot more back and uh, yeah that's their kind of thing 100 percent. and you know with this one too because we had the commandos you know we were still going out if we had our target deck and our target deck was denied well because we were there to enable the Iraqi special operation, their special forces, if they had a target and their target was approved, but it was denied. If it got denied on our end, we just had the Iraqis send it up gotcha. and then we get approved. And then we would go out on that same target. So <laughs> right, right. You know, it was busy, man. We probably, it wasn't Ranger busy, but it was four or five nights a week going out uh -huh. and, you know, a couple ticks got to drop. Um, I'll tell you what was challenging for me. Um, was if, if I wasn't with the Ford element, like if I was back with, you know, the commander, you know, who obviously the, the bomb belongs to him. Right. It was like herding cats, man. You release these dudes and they're gone. You know, Ranger, yeah. there's, there's an element of control like you yep. and the updating is incredible. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? But where I, you know, was the biggest thing for me was battle tracking where, oh, yeah. where these guys had scattered to. Yeah. And I'm having to take the word of, of the Bravo or the team sergeant, because they would deploy with each element. I'm like, are you sure that that's the farthest element? That, that is the farthest element. Like, okay, man. You know, cause it wasn't like they had always gone as far with them as well. Cause we right. kind of think we're going to get out of Iraq at this point a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, so when I would drop in those situations, it was just like, man, I, I'm taking the word of, you know, the Bravo and the team sergeant. Yeah. I know what you mean. Like, uh, when we used to support those guys, we always stayed in the back because we never knew like what they were going to do. It was just, it was so nebulous at that time. Yeah. 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 So, but that, but that like, was, yeah. So you were saying when you drop, you have, you have to take the word of the guys that are with them and yeah. And make and, sure that and, everybody's safe. And, and as well as the aircraft, you know what I mean? Like, okay, you sure. And we didn't get, you know, we were down South, so we didn't always get the, I always got assets, you know, I always have like Apaches and you know, I get 16s and then, gr fours every once in a while we get those guys okay. they were carrying like 200 rounds of what was it 25 millimeter i, I don't even remember what was on the gun at the time but um yeah, yeah. what their gun is and then uh somebody will call me out attack peel be like <laughs> yeah i'm like one thousand pound bomb you know what i mean so they weren't Jeez. there to drop um, right right but the 16s and i started working with preds a lot then too so not you know so mq1s mq9 started coming on board so i always have something for when we went out but it was just, it was kind of hairy, like dropping because you never really knew where these guys were going to be. You're just like, man, I hope yeah. they're tight, man. Hold them tight. You sure you got everybody? <laughs> We've got everybody. I'm like, okay. Um, but you know, it, it was a, it was a good trip. It was a fun trip. I felt like, you know, Hey man, I'm, I'm here. I'm doing what I was trained to do. And you know, the, the team was, was pretty dynamic as well. Just a yeah. wide variety of personalities, but you know, come back from that trip. And that's when I went to Ranger school is between that deployment and my next deployment. So I come back, go to Ranger school and then redeploy. Oh, I will say, man, one thing that I experienced and I'll, I'll never forget it. it. It's not a big deal, but to me, it was a huge deal. My PTT, 
had, you know, I had the, the fancy TEA, PTTs, you know, like mm -hmm. we all had, but I only had two. And I, after that, I had those big, stupid, fat Peltor plastic ones that came with the Peltor. Yeah, yeah. Like my PTT crap the bed, my good one. And I called up to the stock. Your, your push to talk switch for those yeah, who push -to -talk don't switch. know what PTT is. Like. Yeah. And so I called up to the stock, you know, because now I'm, I'm falling under, you know, two series at, at this right. point. And I'm like, hey, man, you know, do you guys have any extra PTTs? My, my push to talk just went out. I've got some, some of these old Peltor ones like. It'll work, but it's not ideal. And like, yeah. And like the next night, a C-130 lands in Basra. And a dude, crew chief steps off and hands me this box with this push to talk. I'm like, jeez, man, I've, I've service. arrived. This is the big game. You know, this is this is good <laughs> stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that, that was, that was for me, just something that simple, you know, yeah. or having leadership called like, hey, man, how you doing? You know, like the commander. Right, right. You know, like, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Like, yeah, anything? Am I in trouble? It's like, no, no, just, just <laughs> calling. Like, wow, that's never happened before. Cool. Yeah, I'm great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I come back from that trip, go to Ranger School. And I think my son's probably, he's, he's probably three, three at this time. So I go to Ranger School. Um, like I said, I recycled. Um, you know, Benning or Darby. And then after that, after that piece in Ranger School, man, I figured out that like all they want to do is hear me yell. Like just just getting people's asses. And I remember like I failed my my patrol and then we lost a set of nods on the second patrol. So everybody oh, in no. a position of leadership. And I was in a position of leadership, was a no go oh, on that mission. Man. So like I, I double no go, man. I, I knew that I knew that I was gonna recycle. So then something clicked. I'm not always the fastest and the smartest. You know, it took me a little while to figure out the game here. Um, they just want to see me like make a decision. They just want to see me yell and make a decision. So then, you know, recycle, come back in for my next patrol. And uh, it, it, it went great. I mean, I was just screaming. I remember one of the RIs was like, damn, Air Force, are you trying to get a job here? I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, but then, you know, I got my go. And then after, you know, for the rest of Ranger School, man, when I went on to Mountains, I got two looks that first week and I was a go on both of those first looks. Nice. And the second week, I didn't even get a look. You know what I mean? I was just like, give me your heavy stuff, man, whatever you guys have. And, you know, you, as Air Force guys, you always peer well because you're doing the fires overlay sheet. And you're helping plan routes so you're in, involved in the process you know from the from day one okay we're putting mortars here so you know after i figured out what they wanted in ranger school like okay man because it's not really intuitive like me yelling and screaming and literally like hey dude i'm sorry i kicked you in the head i really didn't mean that you know literally <laughs> kicked you in the head you know yeah but what i took away and it sounds ridiculous man because guys are like ah oh, you don't need ranger school um i didn't you know, it was never the forward, forward element all the time. You know what I mean? So I learned, I did learn some tactics. I did learn a little bit how the army maneuvers, you know, I came from armor and then went over to SF and it's just like, okay, we're releasing the hounds. So right, I learned, right. you know, more about, you know, that ground piece. And then, um, I also learned that there's different motivations for different people, you know, like oh, for sure. dudes, it's, it's literally kick a guy in the head and he responds well to that. And then there's the, Hey man, I know you're tired. I know you're sucking. We've got to get through this. You know, it's just having that conversation, you know, it's, yeah. it's somewhere in between. So, yeah, yeah. But yeah, completed Ranger School and then went to, ended up deploying, still with 10th Group. Now we're the 17th ASOS. Um, okay. And end up deploying with um, 3rd Group. Okay. Uh, to Afghanistan at this point. And, um, it was the VSO VSP mission set. Um, okay. I don't know if you've if they talk, if you've had anybody on your podcast that's talked about that, but I don't think so yet. No. Um, and I'm gonna hit what I can remember. It's Major Jim Gant. He wrote a really good article about it, um, and I think he kind of revered by his guys in the SF community. Um, I don't know so much about the leadership side, but just, just a phenomenal, brilliant guy who had this crazy concept of, Hey man, 
instead of top down, how about bottom up? We're going to yeah. go, we're going to go, I mean, think about it. It's, it's not cosmic, man. It's not rocket science, but you know, we'd, right. we'd come into Afghanistan, a country that historically has never been held and we're trying to own like legitimately own battle space. And like, what are we doing, man? Like it right. should have been, you know, you know, elements of army, but primarily in my opinion, the primary effort is, you know, special operations. You got SF doing their thing, hearts and minds, and you got Ranger going out and doing the DA piece, you know, and yeah. you know, SF does that too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to, to take that away from them. Um, but, uh, so it was this VSO village stability operations or VSP village stability platforms. And like I said, mm -hmm. if anybody's interested major Jim Gant, look him up. I think he's been on a few podcasts and he, he wrote a, a great paper, a white paper on this concept. But so the idea was you're going to move into a village and you are going to enable this village to defend themselves against the Taliban. Um, yeah. And, and own, you know, their, and, you know, take care of their own and, and solve their own problems. You're going to help them right. problem solve, but you know, yeah. you're going to help them lead to a solution versus, you know, us just going through wiping everything out. And then now what are you left with? So this deployment ended up being about seven months and JD, I think we were in maybe, maybe three ticks, but oh, yeah. I, I didn't drop that entire deployment. And it's the deployment that I remember the best. And I look back on pretty fondly because man, I, I lived, I was living in an Afghan village. You know what I mean? It was, it was like a true SF mission. And I, and I, yeah. or doctrinally, like what you think about like Viet, you know, Vietnam air SF. For sure. Yeah. And you know, what we were doing, we were kind of like a PSD for civil affairs. Um, yeah. We were going out and talking with the village elders, you know, we'd go out twice a day, KLEs and this was in Southern Afghanistan, the Argandab area, um, a little, little village called Nagahan. And, um, you know, we were right there with them. You know, we were going out every single day, meeting with, you know, doing key leader engagements with, uh, you know, with the village elders and yeah. you know, talking to them about what they needed, you know, okay, you need a well. All right, well, here's the deal. We're going to help. We're not going to build you the well we're going to pay you to build a well, All right. you know, <laughs> um, you know, you need this project done. Okay. Well, we'll put the, you know, the wheels in motion to, sure. to allow that to happen. But at the same time we were doing, um, stand up the ALP, the Afghan local police, which the Afghan government was not a fan of because oh. now you're taking locals and you, you're running the potential of stand up this, like once again, another militia. Yeah, but yeah. you have, you know, it's that bottom up approach. And so we stood up this thing called the Afghan local police, even before it was approved, we're still training guys with this yeah. piece. And I got to see how SF solves problems, man. I, I won't go into detail about, you know, we need this. Well, we can find a way to get this to sure. arm these people so they can help defend themselves. But, um, so we stood up the Afghan local police, but this is something, this is a program that takes years, man, to yeah. do to implement and be successful with. And they just didn't have the, the appetite for it, but it was in my mind, it was a, it was a brilliant approach, but I'm, I'm talking like not, not two or three years. You're talking like 20, 30, 40, 50 years sure. um, for, for change to occur. But, well, so that country we were, is so disjoined. I mean, like every single village really couldn't care less about the other village. I mean, and frankly, so, I mean, you to, to have, like you said, for a top-down approach that doesn't even work because th there's some people out there that don't even know anything's going on or who the, even the leader is. I mean, they're just out there, you know, herding their goats or living their life. Yeah. And, you know, if you if you go to each one and empower them to kind of take care of themselves, that you're going to make a lot more money that way for sure. And like you said, it's not going to be overnight, but you can't – yeah, they're – I, mean, I used to go into villages all the time. They'd be like, what are you talking about? Why are you here? Or who, who, you know, and they had no idea what was going on at all. Who, who's so, the yeah. king of Afghanistan? Mm, yeah, no, exactly. man. <laughs> Been a while. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> Been a while. But yeah. And, and, and in doing this, man, I, I really remember I was talking about like that first SF team. It was almost like it was two different teams. You had like, yeah. I'll call it, you know, the ASOT or the level two, level three, where they're, you know, doing their, their surrogate recruiting type thing. And then you had the guys going out at night, you know, banging targets. Um, this team 
they brought everybody on board. Like we would do, okay. you know, it sounds stupid, man, like a morning meeting and an evening meeting. And we talk about, we're going here. This is what this guy does. This is what, you know, this basically like, you know, like here's his packet. This is, right, this right. is the information on this guy. And, um, you know, I was always in the basement, you know, our little talk area, you know, doing up GRGs and the warrant, dude, you talk about a team, like when you think about SF, just how dynamic these guys were and the different backgrounds and how they were able to make it. Um, the captain was prior enlisted, who was 275 Ranger, who got RFS for negligent discharge, oh, for no. negligent discharge with his weapon, you know, which I'm not going to bash anybody, dude. I've seen no. dudes. I, I know guys. I, 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 yeah. I reacted that way because <clears throat> I know how unfortunate it is. It's not, yeah. it's, it's one of those things like, yeah, you, it might have been an accident, whatever it is. It's, it's just unfortunate. I hate it for guys because yeah. I feel so bad for him because it's like an automatic RFS once oh, yeah. you do that. Yeah. You're gone. Um, so he was, you know, he got our fest and then spent time in this big army, got his degree, you know, became an officer and went to SFAS. The team sergeant was just crusty old dude from, from Boston, <laughs> the warrant. And this is what's crazy. Warrant was also like a, a SOT or a SOC. I don't know what it's called now. Level three. Yeah. Probably one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my entire life. Didn't graduate from high school. Was, really? He was a gangbanger, like, you know, was in a gang and uh, I think he was from like somewhere in Texas, like Houston or something like that. Okay. And it was one of those like, hey man, you, you, we don't do jail or army, but these are your choices. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And right. Uh, he joined the army and dude, this guy's IQ was just off the charts, man. And he told me, he's like, I've never read a book that wasn't a military manual. But when it came to like, influencing people, persuading people, you know, recruiting sources. I mean, this dude, I, I've never seen it like it. So I spent a lot of time with him, you know, and figuring out, okay, so this is what they're doing. This is why we have a meat house. I didn't know yet why we had a meat house. I didn't, you know, I mean, like this stuff isn't explained to me, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. So you're just kind of sitting back, taking it all in and just watching him, which definitely came in handy later on with my time, you know, yeah. um, and, and regiment. And then, uh, you know, the, the senior Charlie had a degree in theater. I mean, it was weird. I mean, you had me with a degree in English literature and a minor in philosophy. The, <laughs> the Delta, the senior Delta had a degree in theology. The junior oh, really? Delta had a master's in biology who spent like the last three years studying the effects of radiation on reptiles. I mean, okay. you know, I mean, it was just like this weird team, man, of, of, yeah, of, yeah. of guys that, you're thrown together, but it somehow it works. Um, right. And, uh, but it, it was a great experience, man. Like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't dynamic, but it was living in a village and you never really know. I don't think, I think you could spend a lifetime in Afghanistan. You never really know how the mindset works, but you can at least have a wider window to realize like, okay, this is, we're coming at this from a different approach and the approach right. we're taking is probably not going to be successful in the long run. Yeah. Um, but that was fun, man. That was a good trip. And we were going out twice a day on, on dirt bikes. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, it was just, you know, just getting after, you know, just running amok, man, you know, through <laughs> right. this, the villages of Afghanistan on, on dirt bikes and had a, uh, we bought a pet camel. You remember the coochies, the nomads that would cross yeah. over Afghanistan. We bought a, we bought a camel, had a pet camel. Um, so like when I'm telling you this, like Rangers, like, yeah, this sounds like SF, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, uh, but the camel, man, it was like myself and the Charlie and the mechanic, we were the ones that took care of the camel. I, I do have a, a funny story. So, you know, it ended up being because we were like, we had a kind of a little HLZ that I carved out. So, you know, we ended up being like, it was like the, what was it? Combat, what do they call it? Like combat tourism or whatever, you know, where you get like generals and high. Oh, right. Right. Companies. Yeah. Like where they do the circulation. They visit every, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So we were having somebody come in like once a week and, and we were, because we were successful with the ALP piece, you know, like this was, it was like the model of success. Let's go show off this place and they can okay. fly to it from, from Kandahar. Uh -huh. Um, and so like the fact that we had a camel 
got out and that was like the the cool thing everybody wanted to come see the camel but right. one night we were going out we're going to do like a patrol because we heard that maybe somebody was gonna was going to come through the village so we're doing this like foot patrol through the village and all of a sudden we hear this like and i look i look behind me under my nods and i see the camel you know if you've seen him run you know they got that yeah. stupid neck and he was young and he just comes up to me and you know, I'm like taking a knee and he puts his head on my shoulder and, and the team <laughs> sergeant is flipping out. He's like, Rolo, you know, I'm trying to watch, you know, cause I'm, I'm trying to, he's like, get this GD camel out of here. You and the Charlie take him back. But like everything, you know, like the villain just woke it up because we got this camel coming. Through so, um, but yeah, he so, missed you, man. He, he yeah, was man, your pet. He, he broken loose. I mean, he saw us leaving and he was like, I'm going with these guys, but yeah, you know, I finished up that deployment, like I said, man, maybe three, t I called up maybe three ticks um, yeah, yeah. and didn't end up dropping, but I had a, it was just a great team and it was a great time. But during that deployment, I'd hang out like on the top of our, our little talk there, you know, at night. And I would see like this village where we just were, and I'd see this, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, you know, gunship and it was Rangers, man, just Ranger smash. I'm like, you know what? I, I, I want to, I want to see what this is all about. So I called up yeah. like, I'm like, Hey man, you know, I know that we're at this point, they had taken, you know, the SF mission, you know, for tech P's, it wasn't going away, but we were going to fall into like two series STs with the, with the controllers. Right. Um, and I had gone out, I met the dudes at two seven five. I'd done a few TDYs with like Stan house, Josh Howard, Jordan Jacobowski, Burt, Burt Reynolds, yeah. who Next, bunch of not even guys, his real so. name, man. I can't even think of Burt's real name. <laughs> no, his last name is his last name's Reynolds, but his first name is yeah, yeah. Burt. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, Brian. You know what I mean? So I'd done some TDYs with them, and, and they're telling me about Ranger, you know, what Rangers do. And I'm like, dude, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even know that that existed. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, like my mind's <laughs> being blown just hearing these stories. Right, right. So I call up, I hit up Slyke. I'm like, hey, man, I really want to... I'd like to go to 275. I think I mentioned that to you too when you came out. Um, okay. Um, for my eval, I was like, hey, man, I'm kind of interested in, in, you know, to, I'd like to go out to 275. Um, you know, my wife at the time, we met in Washington. She loved Washington. She wanted to come back to Washington. And like, cool, man, I, I, I think we can make this happen. And, you know, I, I'd have had my tab. Um, but yeah, you're a perfect candidate. I'm, I'm sure I can't remember exactly what I said, but I'm sure I was like very encouraged. Like, I'm gonna like, make a yeah, phone call. Like, I'll, like you got excited. Like I'm going to make a phone call like right now. Yeah. So <laughs> like you were, I, I felt very positive about it. I didn't feel like yeah, you were, yeah. you know, give me a line of BS. You're like, Hey man, yeah, this sounds awesome. So, um, you know, the, the thought was I was going to go from that trip because I wanted to go on the ranger side of the house. And it's not that I didn't enjoy SF man. And sure. I didn't think that they were doing great things, but I'll be honest, man, for me, I always want to be on the team. I always right. want to be on a team. And it's huge for me is being, being part of that, that team. I don't even, mm -hmm. I don't have to be the quarterback. I just want to be, uh, but you know, I'm like the center, man. I want to touch the ball every play. You know what I mean? Right. I don't have to be the hero, but I, I want to be on a team. Yeah. And I value that. And although I had a great time with SF, I didn't get that feeling because deployed I did. But stateside, I didn't because I wasn't training with the people I was deploying with. Right. Um, and I knew with Ranger. And it was no hit, like, and just to, I don't mean to cut you off, but like, I don't want people to get the wrong impression that you guys weren't trying to do that. But there were so, there's so many ODAs in the world and there's so few SOF or SFJ tags, even now to this day, that you, you were, whoever was in the fight, that's who you went with. It wasn't like, you know, you didn't want to uh, train with 10th group. It's just that 10th group wasn't deployed. Fifth group or third group was at the time, so that's who you, you covered down on. And I really felt bad for you guys because you 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 did live and work with the, the groups that you were kind of stationed with, but then, yeah, you deployed with somebody else, and then you had to figure it all out. You had to, like, get rapport with that team, and, yeah, it was very challenging for sure. Yeah, and that's, you know, and if you talk to, like, you know, Mignon or some of the older guys who spent time with SF, they did, like, back in the day. And then, like you yeah. said, the, you know, you had two wars going on, man, and right. you just didn't have the bodies for it. So um, for sure, I but I wanted to be, I wanted to train with and deploy with the same team. 
Um, yeah. that was appealing and, uh, makes sense. And I, and I, I love working with SF, man. Like if, if you look at my personality, it's probably more suited towards that piece. You know, I, I'm right. doing this VSO VSP thing, man. It was like the Peace Corps with guns and everybody else is like bitching and complaining. I'm like, I'm having the time of my life. I got a beard and running around on a motorcycle. I got a pet camel. I'm able to call in airstrikes if I need to, you know, it didn't happen. You're helping people. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, you know, but if, if we got to switch, you know, if, if we got to flip that switch and, you know, get after it, then we can totally get after it too. So, right. Right. Um, but so they were working towards, you know, me coming over to the Ranger side versus the two series and it's like, worked it hard. He was like, Hey man, I can't, I can't get you to two seven five, but I'm looking at maybe bringing you and Matt Davis over to RC as well as Justin Foles. Um, yeah, which, yeah. you know, and we, we kind of came over right around the same time now Foles, but Foles was a battalion. Foles was a one seven five. Right. He's like, you know, Foles. And at the time they were like, you know, the thing that RC was saying was like, okay, well, they're not going to do our selection they're going to do our our rtc or our otc if right. they have a tab then that that'll work and we'll put them through otc so um you know the and, and you know gav gav had worked the sf mission and he saw what was going on with rc and he was like hey man i, th I think these guys would be a good fit to bring over um but there was a little bit of stink man like from I, and I didn't realize it. I didn't know it, you know, like coming over. And, but anyway, Schleich hit me up and he was like, Hey man, I can't get you to 275, but you want to go to RRC. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that's Fort Benning. That's not Washington. <laughs> right. That's not what I talked to my wife about, <laughs> but man, I really want to go over to RRC. So yeah. I hit my wife up and I was like, Hey, what, what do you think about this? Fort Benning, Georgia, and my family's in Georgia. And she's just like, yeah, we can do it. I'm like, all right. So I hit up Schleich, I'm like, yeah, man, I, I definitely want to do this. And dude, Sweet. I didn't, I didn't know what RC did. I knew yeah. like I'd, I'd seen you guys at that jump week and I knew you had beards and I knew you were free fall qualified. I, right. you know, had a beard on that deployment. I was not free fall qualified. You know what I mean? <laughs> so right. uh, they're like, yeah, man, <laughs> we'll, we'll get you over to RC. So I came back from that trip. Um, I think I was there maybe three or four months um, and packed up, moved across the country, moved, moved to Georgia. So, um, and uh, show up at RRC um, and dude, I, I will tell you the, there, there's, cause I, I want to be careful about this cause I don't want to talk bad about SF because like I said, my time there was great sure. with the fifth group team and the PNTs and the, you know, the third group team, like you go shoot, you go do whatever. I was like, okay, like I'm not the best shot in the group. I'm not the best at this, but like I'm, I'm upper, I'm upper, you know, whatever. Right. When I got to RRC, <laughs> it was like, dude, I don't know if I'm good enough. <laughs> you know? It was, I know exactly what you mean. It was just uh, like, dude, I, 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 man. Like it was, it was, um, you know, first of all, I got to do, you know, six months of OTC, you know, yeah. RTC it's Rangers. So you got to put an R in front of it. Sure. Sure. Um, and dude, that was like, it was like the army air Corps every single day. It was, it was yeah. in, in my perspective. I mean, like, it was just like, this is the best life I'm living right now. I'm waking up every single day and I'm training you know, with, with these guys. And, and in that class, like I, I felt good in the class, like, all right, I'm, I'm hanging in there or, you know, upper tier with the dudes I'm going through RTC with. Um, and it was, it was a great experience. I learned a lot. I had, um, you know, I'm grateful for it. I had a great instructors that, you know, I think Casey Dolly. Yeah. Is, awesome guy. I, I think he's retired now, but Sergeant major. And then Rob Trom Trimble. Trimble. Yeah. And yep. Rob, once again, just great. I, th I think Rob's still putting dudes through. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rob was there when I first got there and he'd been there for a little bit anyway. So he's, he's been around that community for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well versed in it. So like, you know, every day was just a great day to wake up and train, but I knew that, man, I'm, I'm, 
I'm about to get really, 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 really busy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And oh, yeah. Um, once again, I kind of had that same experience where I didn't realize it because I didn't have battalion time. Like mm -hmm. RC didn't really fault me. They didn't want to hear any SF stories. They didn't want to hear any big army stories because it doesn't matter. If it's not Ranger, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, like, right. Your, your existence prior to coming to Ranger doesn't matter. Like whatever you've yeah. done, whatever you think you've done doesn't matter. But everybody's a leg, no matter how, uh, Dunker, if you're yeah. airborne or not, you're all legs. Yeah, it's all. <laughs> and, and to this day, I love Ranger. I love Ranger. Yeah. But Ranger hates everybody but Ranger and dudes <laughs> right. up at the unit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. If you're not one of those two, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, yeah, that's but, true. Uh, so, like I said, during RTC, it was it was a kick in the you know kick in the junk, but it was it was great training, man. Like I learned a lot, and, and it's cool stuff to tr learn. It's not like just normal run of the mill military training. It's like super cool, like you know, in, you know, specialized training. It's really because right. I, I didn't go through it, but I was I had the honor of like helping those guys run a class or two. Yeah. So like I, I, I saw what they, what they guys threw. And of course I cross trained all that stuff, but yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's so cool. Yeah. And I was, I couldn't, when you guys, when they said you were going through the course, I thought that was so awesome because like, it just gives you a little more credibility too. You know, like, you know, for guys like us, we just walk in, we're like, Hey, where are your JTAC now? They're like, where'd you come from? I have no idea. Who, you know, if, for those of us who were battalion first, it kind of helped, but yeah, for you guys that went through the course, I mean, that's great. I mean, that was just, like I said, it gives you more credibility for the team for sure. It, it does. And it, knowledge on the team. Like if they're like, Hey, go get that, go do this. Then you already know what that is. I mean, so it's, yeah, it's just, I, it was a, a lot better all the way around for sure. Yeah, that, that piece was good, man. And it was, um, that, that piece was good. But you, you say that like there've been multiple times where it's been like JD wouldn't have done that to me. You know I mean? That's not how JD <laughs> did it. That's not how Foster did it. That's not how right. Matty Green did it, you know. <laughs> Gav didn't do it that way. I'm like, all right, okay, you're, you're uh, right. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you guys, the, the legacy you guys left there is is, is impressive. Like Chella would talk to me, uh, and and Cooper would talk to me yeah. about you, like to the day. Oh, I love those guys. Day, God, that was yeah. That the the some of the funnest time was being was hanging out with Coop and uh, and John Chella. Man, that was just in that team, guys. You know, just. We, the whole team was great, but yeah, those two were a good influence. Um, Terry Heflin was another guy that was just great awesome. Dude, uh, <laughs> yeah, Sean Deegan, just great. Another, just man, yeah, I love that team. I just, loved being around those guys for sure. Great guys, man. Great yeah, teams. Yeah. But Kurt Tegmeyer, I mean, another guy that um, was. All, I don't know if you ran across Kurt at all. Was he uh, was there? Here's what's interesting. Dude. He was our first sergeant, and then his brother was the battalion commander. Right, right. Yes. Didn't he? Wasn't he the RCO too? Didn't yeah. he become the oh, RCO later? He was the RCO. He was the RCO. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, one day, Crazy. Like, hey, uh, worked with your brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Major Tegmar would come into our, well, like when we were deployed, he'd come in and, you know, they would kind of shoot the shit or whatever. And then I left and lost track of all those guys. And then later, later on, I heard that. You know, his brother was the RCO. I'm like, that's crazy. That's uh, that's awesome for sure. And he, he was a great dude. So yeah. well deserved, obviously. But yeah, that was cool. Yeah, it was. He was yeah. a great guy to work for. And, um, yeah, and his brother was too. As a first sergeant, I mean, and all those all those names, all those guys just named. I mean, in my mind, they're they're legacy dudes in RC. Yeah, yeah. They're or you know RD. Um, but yeah, just just phenomenal people. But uh, yeah, show up you know, get to the 17th. And I, once again, I wasn't really tracking that, you know, there might've been people at battalion that were butthurt on the 17th side yeah. because I didn't have battalion time. And here I am coming over to RC, but this is, this is Gavin Schleich. You know what I mean? This is, this was their call. That's what they wanted to right. do. And, and I think it worked out, man. I, I do. I think when RC does it, they bring people from the big army, you know what I mean? For sure. They, yeah. Yeah. You know, Oh yeah, I don't think any of us. I don't think any of us at the top level who knew the real deal had a problem with it. Yeah. Um, I you know obviously there's going to be some animosity because those guys want to be there too. But um, yeah, what you can only do what you can do. I mean, yeah. it's it's none of your business at that time. You just got to you know kind of let it roll off your back. And I'm sure you did. You know, yeah, sure and I did, man. I got that much. same. It, it it was like it reminded me of remember how I told you I had those two. Uh, to kind of overweight out the past from master sergeant saying cross trainees don't do well as tac P's, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of like, I got that same, you know, 
guys from the SF side don't do well with Ranger. Like, <laughs> okay. All right. We'll see. Yeah. You know I mean? I just, just yeah. you know, didn't, didn't even, didn't even factor in, but you know, right, finished right. Up, you know, finished up RTC and I, I didn't get to do like the last like culmination because I team, I went over to team three, replaced Foster, which is yeah. a hard thing to do, man. And like, it is the dude is, is just a wealth of knowledge and an awesome, awesome. I've got nothing but, and, and you know, everybody's got funny foster stories, but that's just because he puts it out there. And when I that's say right. he puts it out there, he puts it out there because this is what I did. This is how I messed up. Let me share this story with you. And right. I, I kind of try to do the same way, man. I, I tell people I, if there's a mistake to make in your career, you know, I've, I've, I've definitely made it. Um, yeah. You know, one screw I hear you. another and l- let me tell you what I did. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. oh, I did it twice. <laughs> it took me two times to figure it out. So <laughs> right. um, when I replaced Foster on, on team three and uh, you know, I, I, so I went to free fall school and then I started RTC and okay. you know, I, when I said I went to Yuma and you know, I got my 23 jumps and I think you're thinking, all right, man, I'm a free fall God, you know? <laughs> And then I do, you know, RTC, we do canopy control and that helps, man. I got, you know, probably yeah. another 30 jumps at canopy control, you know, it's, but you're also jumping with a bunch of other people who, you know, they might've done the closed course. So they still have more jumps than me. Yeah. But dude, I, I get to team three, man. And it's just like foster and, and the team sergeant were, were best friends. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they weren't happy about losing foster. Right, right. Like, well, he's got his tab. That's good, but he's not Mark. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, that first yeah, Mark left some big shoes. I mean, he he was so yeah. motivated and just so helpful, and like just yeah, you know, he was a the kind of linchpin of the of any team he's yeah, on. He's absolutely. like the guy, you know. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And he he was you say the linchpin, and he's also that guy that um, that I, I guess that's what a linchpin is, man. He, he brings it together. If you've got right. elements that are not getting along, you bring somebody like Mark into the mix everybody's going to get along, you know? Yeah, so for sure. Mark, if you listen to this, man, you're, you're thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's enough. I don't want him getting too big ahead. That's no, no, enough. No, no. I'll, call him <laughs> out. I'll call him out on something stupid here. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. So went over there and, you know, team three and it was, dude, it, it was, even though I'd done RTC, like I told you, it was like drinking through a fire hose. Um, yeah. And, you know, even going through RTC, and, you know, and talking with Gab, I still didn't have a clear understanding of what I was going to do. Like, you know, mm-hmm. we're training for a, you know, our traditional tack recce mission, you know, um, which dude, full disclosure, and I'll tell people this, man, I didn't do one tack recce in Afghanistan, you know? Yeah. I, me neither. I've got, Not really. Yeah. I've got four, <clears throat> five trips with those guys and, you know, and I spent, you know, three, I was with team three and then they kind of consolidated teams. So I was with team three and team five for the, that entire time, which, you know, yeah. it's awesome because I still talk to those dudes, man, like Brandon Parsons, Taylor McNeil, uh, Felipe Peters, PD. I mean, those are the guys that, that I still talk to day to day. I got a text from Lancaster, ATL, Aaron Totten, Lancaster land. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, it, like just Great randomly, guy. you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, so th- those are the guys, because I spent, you know, five years with those dudes, man, like every yeah. single day, like I had a desk in their team room. Yes. I was yeah. in the 17th STS, but dude, if I was really, dude, I, I was on team three, like that For sure. and leadership allowed that to happen. And Gav, yeah. Gav, and at the time it was uh, captain and major couch member, like you go to, you go do team stuff. We'll take care of flight chief officer stuff. You're here to support the team, dude. And so yeah. it was, just, it's gotta be that way yeah. to, to properly do it. It's gotta be that way for sure. But it was, it was a learning curve, man. I felt like every day that first <laughs> training cycle, my job was on the line. I mean, it yeah. was, uh, the first jump, like I did with them, <laughs> we land and I, I feel like I'm, all right, man, I'm, I'm, I'm within, you know, 50, you know, 50 meters. I'm like, I think I'm good. <laughs> no, dude. Like, and I'll, I'll go to the team stars and I'm like, Hey man, you know, how, how was that? And they're like, it sucked. You were backslide. I'm like, dang it. Okay. <laughs> so then, and then I go up, 
I like, all right, man. I was like, so I go up, I go up again and I'm like, we jump, we land. I'm like, how is that? You suck. I was like, was I backsliding? He was like, no, you weren't backsliding, but you did, you weren't your 25 and 25 under canopy. I'm like, dang it. So like every jump, you know, cause these guys had had, I mean, I'm coming in with maybe 50, maybe yeah. 50 jumps. And these guys were, had been together for a long time and they're in the thousands. And when yeah. I say they're kicking canopies, they're, they're kicking canopies. I mean, they're, right, they're that right. tight. And, uh, so I remember the, he was the six on the team and he ended up becoming the team sergeant. He's, he's one of my best friends, Parsons. It's like, all right, dude, here's what you were doing. This is what you're doing. Work on this, work yeah. on this. And then, and then it started, you know, getting better. I never got as good as them jumping. Um, I felt like I was a good jumper, like in the 17th, like fully confident leading jumps and things like that. And, you know, right, right. ended up going to jump master school, you know, free fall mm -hmm. jam, but you know, when you've got guys that have been jumping together for that length of time and then are in the thousands of jumps, um, yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm in my career, like 300 something jumps, you know, All right, right. And these guys are in the thousands, man. They're, they're just, they're just amazing. So, yeah, but you know, it, it got better, man. And I started learning the ins and outs and, um, but that first training cycle was brutal. <laughs> it was just like, man, every single day. And, and this is a point like in my career too, where, I'm, I'm not, something's going on in my head and I'm not really knowing what's going on. You know, I remember mm -hmm. I'm home and my son is like, are you upset dad? And so we, we moved, we moved when he was five. So he's probably like seven, seven or eight. So I've been in you know, RC a couple of years. I'm like, no, why? And I'm, I'm talking to him and like my fists are clenched. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm not mad. I'm not, you know, and he was like, cause your fists are clenched. I'm like, okay. You know, but you know, you just, I was just wound so tight and, um, sure. you know, you deploy, you ended up deploying twice in one year. Um, and it wasn't, you know, on those deployments, you know, we were doing our, our thing with, um, how much have we talked about? How much has gone into what RC was doing in Afghanistan later on? Um, uh, not much. Okay. Yeah. Go, feel free. And um, without getting too deep, yeah, I mean, so, you know, you know, like I said, it was, very, see, that's what I was going to say before you, like when you were talking about doing your, the RTC, there was a lot of tactical recce stuff, but then once, I mean, even when my first deployment with them, we weren't even doing that stuff. We were doing like such, such a broad array of mission sets, you know, like it was like, Hey, RRC, you have these, um, you have these capabilities. So they would just let we did all kinds of different things. So it was like, it was very hard to nail down exactly what you should have been doing. You just kind of had to go with it and be like, okay, this is the mission today. How are we going to skin this cat? And yeah, it was, so anyway, I, yeah, yeah, it was very hard to nail down a specific mission set that we did. Cause it wasn't, there was one. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and that's, so like RTC, man, like when I went through, it was very tack recce heavy. Well, right. when we went to Afghanistan, it wasn't tack recce heavy, but what I did have was, you know, remember I was talking about that warrant officer and spending time in the talk and, you know, he would do meets with, you know, surrogates. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had that experience. And so oh, good. RC had kind of taken on a different role and they, they were yeah. kind of going down that path and they had based that off of, you know, like a three letter agencies program, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, I, I'm not going to throw the names out, but we'll just say I was, you know, I was basically handling surrogates, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and we, they were, we just say OGA, a lot of OGA stuff. Yeah. You basically do yeah. a lot of OGA stuff, man. And so I was responsible for, you know, at various times, like up to 11 Afghans. Um, yeah. and where I had, I felt like I kind of excelled was I would spend time getting to know these dudes, um, kind of know their motivations, what, what, what motivated them and how to get them to do what I needed them to do. Because as a white dude, you know, in, in Afghanistan, I, I can get tan, I can grow a beard, I can dye my hair black, I can put on a pacol, I can put on a man dress. If we're driving in a vehicle, I can pass that first glance, but like, man, you stop me on the street, dude, I don't speak Pashtun or Dari or, right, right. or Uzbek or, you know, or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's just how to influence these people to do the things that we need them to do that we had traditionally done an attack recce role, but now you're having these guys go out and do it or being able to 
pull bits of information and we can filter that information up to battalion like oh this guy you're looking for well my dude says that he's here at this time and and so we did from that standpoint man on those trips we did some pretty amazing stuff um that was just totally kind of outside of what you think of when you think of ranger you know what i mean sure like i said you're doing oh, like yeah. oga type things and um and and with that you know we had guys that had gone to like ASOT and ASOC, they had gotten waivers, but they're 11 Bravos in order to go to those courses. You can't be, you know, you had to get a waiver as an 11 Bravo. You had to be an 18 series or an Intel bill right. or something like that. But, you know, we weren't the stuff that we were doing. We had to be trained on how to do it. And so we could then train our, you know, our counterparts on how to do it. Right. So a lot of cool training, a lot of urban reconnaissance, um, which we ended up doing, um, you know, in the city. Cause like I said, in a vehicle, it's fine. Now, if I have to get out, you know, do whatever, um, it makes it a lot more difficult. For so, sure. um, but I found I was, I was pretty good at that stuff because I could, I could just have conversations with people and I could yeah. talk to them about, you know, Hey, what, what motivates, what, what their motivators are, whether it's money, whether it's ego, like, Hey man, like you're, you are the Jason Bourne of Afghanistan and <laughs> you are the ground force commander, you know, right, you, right. you know, it's just talking to that piece of like, Hey man, whatever you're comfortable with, I'm not there. I I'm here to support you. I'm here as backup. If something happens, I will come get you, you know, we'll be there, but you know, it's been able to get these guys to, to go out and and do some of the stuff that we had traditionally done. And then you can then take a, a targeting packet and hand it to somebody and like, here's your dude. He's going to be here at this time. So it's just a lot of human type stuff. Um, yeah. And I found I was good at it, but I, I will say after five years, five deployments of managing Afghans and Afghan problems, that's exhausting, dude. Like yeah. it, it, it is, it took an emotional toll in the sense that, you know, after every deployment, I would get on the bird flying home and I'd be like, Oh man, thank God. Thank God. nobody, <laughs> Right. Died. You know what I mean? Thank God. Nobody died under my watch. Um, yeah. because I do, you, you do end up building a relationship with these guys and they are out there alone and unafraid and they're living it every day. And I've got empathy and I've got a little bit of understanding because I came from SF where you can only drive a guy so hard, but I'm there four yeah. months and then I leave. And they get another guy comes in and he's going to ride him and he's going to ride him and he's going to ride him. So, yeah. you know, I just, I really tried to weigh, they're in this for the long haul, man. You know, they're, they've got a, in four months I'm out of here and they're going to have a new guy coming in and I don't know what his personality is going to be like. So, um, ATL just hit me up. I just saw my phone. Oh, did. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, they're, and they're going to ride him and they're going to ride him. So it's just a matter of, of finding that right balance to get them to do yeah. what we need them to do. Um, but within that, man, I got to, you know, so you're working that piece typically during the day. Um, but Royal was one seven five. Uh, he had the guy that was my romad on that, that trip right, right. To my last big army trip to Iraq. And, um, so he's one seven five and, you know, they're going out at night and, He's like, Hey man, do you want to roll? I'm like, well, yeah. So I did get to go out with Italian. I did get to say, nice. you know, you know, dual JTAC mission sets, you know, you've got one JTAC co-located here. You got another JTAC co-located here. So I did get that battalion experience being able to go out and, you know, it's funny cause I, you know, time with RC or, you know, RSTB now. And then, um, you know, then I, but my training cycle, my rotation was with 175. So I really okay. got to know 175 really well. And I'm going out at night with 175. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, later on in my career, coming out to 275. So I got exposed to the two battalion and I got to experience that life and go out with those guys and, and just you're having dual JTACs on a target, you know. But I'd tell Royal, like, dude, this is your show, man. You you are the primary JTAC. Or I'd go out with, Clint Jerron, you know, who's at the 14th, yeah, um, yeah. you know, and like, Hey man, you, you've got the lead. I'm, I'm just, I'm here to support whoever's in the best position. Right. And that worked out. And, and I feel fortunate because within that, you know, that first RSC trip I spent, I was with, you know, OGA. So mm -hmm. I got exposed to that side of the house too. 
and got to be at JTAC with those guys. And then, you know, on another rotation, um, me and uh, my, my, I was with another RRC guy, uh, Taylor McNeil. He's retired now, so I'll call his name out. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we were, we were in Conduce and, you know, we were with the guys from, from North Carolina and, yeah. um, you know, from the unit there. And, and they had, they had a JTAC. And he was a good JTAC, you know, 724 guy was awesome, dude. Um, sure. But their counterpart, Mez, his counterpart, Mez, ended up getting shot, uh, oh. recovered. And he's, he's fine now, but, you know, it was a control. Oh, good. He ended up getting shot. And then the, the sergeant major knew my RC buddy because he was like his platoon sergeant when he was a young private at 275. Yeah, yeah. And so, and we were in every meeting, you know, because we're kind of on the intel side of the house. Yeah, and he yeah. knew that I was, he's like, Hey man, you're a JTAC, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, if we lose this guy, then we're kind of down. Do you guys want to start going out with us at night? And we're like, yeah, yeah of course I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I had that opportunity where, you know, with these guys in Conduce and once again, it was like with 175, you know, like, Hey man, you're the 724, you're the lead JTAC, but it was like, whoever's in the best position to take the control, take the control. And, you know, I got, sure. I got to, to go out and experience that. So, you know, my time with RRC was really eye opening because, you know, I got to work with, you know, you know, battalion nightly. I got to work with, you know, OGA nightly. I got to work with dudes from the unit, you know, nightly. And then I'm doing yeah. my RRC thing, you know, where I'm, you know, managing these individuals. Right. Um, and then you know, you're getting exposed to like the tech side of the house too, man, where it's just, um, it's just amazing, you know, just, just a lot of stuff coming at you. And I, I found what, what I started realizing though, is like, okay, now I'm, I'm kind of the jack of all trades, master of none though, at this point, because there's, there's a lot coming at me. Um, yeah, that's yeah. fine. I, I was never that dude that if, if I didn't know, I didn't know. I'm like, Hey man, I, I don't know what this does. Sure. Yeah. I need, I need some time with that, but so yeah, man, that, that was a great experience, you know, spent, you know, five years with team three, team five. And those are the guys I talk to, you know, to this day still. But yeah, so I mean, you know, my my time with with RC for, for me, it's just it was just amazing. And then you know the, the amount of talent, not even on the army side, but just you know it, within the seventeenth, I'm yeah. I'm watching. You know, I'm with Matt Davis. You know what I mean? Like, and, yeah. and Matt and I were peers for a long, ended up, I ended up being the flight chief. It's just, I just had time and service and made, you know, E7 before he did, you know, Matt, yeah. Matt's the chief now back at the 17th doing awesome things. Right. And I just feel fortunate that I was able to work with, you know, Matt Davis and Justin, uh, Mike Garino. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's dudes, there's a couple dudes I'm leaving out intentionally that are still in that are, you know, doing some, some cool stuff that, that I work okay. with that, I don't think would appreciate their name you know, being thrown <laughs> out there, but, uh, right, right. you know, just the, the amount of talent that was there. Um, and then the leadership and then seeing the 17th grow and develop from where it was when I first came. And there's something to be said, like when I first got there, it's like, go do army things. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's kind of like, I'll, I'll, I'll go do army things. Um, right. but and there's a little, there's a lot of flexibility with that. I, I sh I'm sure you've deployed many times without orders from the 17th. Oh yeah. Guess who always had you on their orders? The army. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So you know, you had orders. It was just you know with Ranger. Um, right. Right. But I saw those changes in place, and and you know, you look at what what the 17th has now, where it's come from, from where it was, and it just keeps getting better and better, and the quality of guys. I mean, the, the, these, I don't want to say kids, but these young men are just oh, for much sure. smarter than, than I ever was. You know, I was the guy that was like, I need a volunteer who I'll, I'll try it. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I'll do it. I'll, I'll put it out <laughs> yeah. there. I'll put it out there. You know what I mean? I was never afraid to, to give it a shot. And, but these are guys that are putting it out there that not only are afraid to put it out there, but they also have the intelligence You know, I, I, to yeah. come back. And I like to say that, you know, I just try real hard until I actually figure it out and then I'll eventually <laughs> figure it out. I can relate to that yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I try real hard. I try real try yeah. real hard. But you know, this is also a time frame for me. And you know, I, I do want to talk about this a little bit because I think it's important for my journey. 
um, this is when, you know, I quit drinking, you know, in 2006, about six months after my son was born, you know, I, I had to make some, some serious, you know, life decisions and, and got into a little bit of trouble, um, from drinking. And, uh, but it was, it was the kind of thing where people had seen, you know, my character and they're like, Hey man, you can recover from this. And, you know, um, so, and this is prior to coming over to the soft side. So like, this is disclosed, you know, like when I'm coming over, you know what I mean? Like, Hey man, there, there was, yeah, a, sure. there was an issue. Um, cause then I think it came over in like 2008. And so, you know, 12 years with the 17th. And so I had to, you know, I had to make a life choice. Like, you know, I, I I've got to quit drinking, you know, uh, my son's born, uh, he's six months old. Um, and you know, a lot of, a lot of support from my peers is TAC P's and no pressure there from them. And then, you know, honestly, a lot of support from, you know, my, my ex-wife, uh, to, to kind of get me through that process. And, um, so at this point, you know, like we're, we're kind of ending, you know, fast forward 2006, 2016, you know, that's kind of 10 years of, of, you know, complete sobriety. And I'm starting to feel some cracks in the armor, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm burning the candle at both ends. Um, I, coming home and, you know, we have psych docs, but it's not really something that I can disclose that, Hey man, I'm thinking about drinking or I'm wanting to fall back on drinking. Like I'm telling the psych doc, you know, we had a psych doc at the unit and yeah. um, pr even prior to him coming to the unit, I reached out to, you know, the 720th psych doc I was like, Hey man, I'm, I'm having, I'm having some issues here, man. Like my, my marriage is, is tough. I'm, I'm wound so tight. I can't relax, you know, things I'm, I'm struggling. And, you know, he gave me some good advice, um, but it was kind of like a mandate. And then mm -hmm. we got our psych doc and, and, you know, this is kind of what I was alluding to, like the support group network, that the 17th got, you know, we got a psych doc and we got, uh, you know, a physical therapist, you know, and I'm also dealing with injuries that haven't been fixed, you know, back, I ended right. up having back surgery, ended up having wrist surgery. Um, and I'm just wound so tight and I'm, I'm really thinking in my mind, like I can never quit doing this because if I quit doing this, then I have to lay this burden on somebody else. Like, what is that? You know what I mean? That, yeah. that, that's a stupid thought process, man. You do your But it's not exclusive to you though. And that's the yeah. thing. And that, and I'm glad you're bringing it up because there's a lot of guys that feel that way. Yeah. So please go ahead. I didn't yeah. mean to cut you no, off. It's, but... it's, it's good to hear that piece, but you know, so I'm telling, and I'm not blaming the psych doc. Like this is on me. I'm, I'm telling the psych doc. I'm like, look, I'm, I'm, I feel like I need a break. I feel like I'm wound so tight. And, and I don't even think I had enough. I knew something was going on, but I'm so like tunnel vision and so mission set and thinking, well, I, I have to do this. Nobody else can do it. And if I don't go on this trip, like I had to miss one rotation because I had back surgery. And then I ended up not deploying with that team and deploying with another team four months later where I'm still not even cleared to jump yet but I'm cleared to control and deploy, you know, and this is after yeah. back surgery because I feel like I have to get back in the fight. And right, so I'm right. telling the docs like, yeah, I'm just really tired. I'm having a hard time relaxing. You know, I'm, I'm opening up the best way I know how and as openly as I know how, because I'm afraid that if I tell them, Hey man, I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to drink or I feel like I need to take a break. I couldn't even say that because yeah. I'm alluding to it. I'm throwing up like little, little pin flares, you know, hoping that he'll right, catch right. on, but I can't even say, Hey man, I'm at my breaking point and I'm going to start drinking again. And I'm feeling stressed and my marriage is a train wreck. And I feel like I'm a crappy dad because I'm never at home because I always had this, this push and pull, man. Like my son's the most important thing to me in the world. And then there's the military and if I'm not with my son, I feel guilty. And if I'm not with the military and my team, I feel guilty. So I'm yeah. having this constant pull of no matter what I'm doing, I have this just guilt. I mean, I'm just feeling mm -hmm. this guilt, this overriding guilt. And so I'm starting to, the cracks are starting to form. Um, they really are. And you know, what I should have done hindsight 
and I don't regret it because you're, I'm where I am now. You know what I mean? I just wish I would have gone about it differently. What I should have done was like, Hey man, I need a break and I need a real break. I don't need like, mm -hmm. Hey, take a knee. Like I need to, I need to go back. I need to regroup. Um, I need to figure something out at this point. You know, I'm an E7, I'm the flight chief, you know, and, um, yeah. I, I, you, you know, I, JD, my grandmother died and this is, you know, I could have, she died. And then the next day, and this is, I grew up in Georgia, man. Like everybody's, your cousin's right down the street. Like my grandmother spent, you know, every day with her growing up, you know what I mean? And uh, she passed away. And the next day I got on a flight and deployed. I could have stayed, I could have stayed back. You know, I could have stayed back and gone to the funeral. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I felt like I, I, had, I couldn't leave, let the team down, you know? And, um, so, you know, I did that. And then along with this process, uh, you know, Gab ended up passing away while I was on a deployment. Um, I didn't process that. I put that away, but that affected my son in ways that I didn't know because my son Jackson was good friends with Gab's son, Austin. So now okay. it's getting real for my son. Like, okay, dad's not only going to war every year, he is his friends are dying in training. It got to the point where I was like, Hey man, I'm, I'm going on a TDY. He's like, what are you going to be doing? Are you jumping? You know what I mean? So it's like, oh this gosh, constant. Yeah. and so like, I look back on that for him, man, like the burden that I left on him and you know, I'm forgiving myself for it, but the burden I left on him is like, you know, every year he's living with the fear that dad's going to deploy and die. And then now he's living with the fear of dad's jumping out of an airplane. Dad could, right. dad could die. Um, and, you know, time with, you know, battalion and then, you know, the big army and then that 101st point, we lost a lot of dudes to IEDs, you know what I mean? And I yeah. never went to one ramp ceremony to this day, I'm 47 and I haven't been to one funeral. Like, you know what I mean? I just, I just would put it away. I would put it away and I could right. feel all of this building up from all this time frame, and, and the only way that I knew, I knew that I was getting through not drinking because of thinking about the repercussions for my career. And it's bad that I'm saying this and I was thinking about the repercussions for my career. And then I'm also thinking about the repercussions for my family, but you heard what yeah. I said first, right? Right. That's fucked up. I said, sorry, yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to drop F bombs on this, but you know, I'm thinking career. Oh, no, it's fine. Yeah. I'm thinking career. You know what I mean? And like, so, so I'm throwing up pen flares and I know that something's happening, but, um, it's not enough. I'm not saying that, Hey man, I need, I need, I need a break. And, uh, and he wasn't picking up on those. He wasn't picking up on anything. He's not clairvoyant, man. He sure. Know, no, for and, sure. And, and, you know, if I would have done that and then he would have been like, Hey man, well, we're going to keep you back. I would have pitched a fit. You know what I mean? I would have been yeah. pissed. You know what I mean? Um, so you know, we're at 2016 and I'd actually gotten hired. You, you remember Eric Mueller? Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. So I had gotten hired to replace him up in Syracuse, take his E8 position. He was going to fall into the chief position and I was going to go AGR. I was like, all right, man, this will, I'll finish out. I'll make chief in like four years and I'll be done, you know, and retire right. 20. Um, because, you know, now I'm trying to figure out like what my next move is after RRC, you know, I've got like less than a year left. And, um, our commander at the time, awesome dude, you know, Colonel Alexander was like, Hey, um, we need, we need a detachment chief for, you know, 275. Would you be interested? And I mean, yeah, dude, of course stay with right. Ranger. And then my ex, I can get her back to Washington. Like this is, yeah. this is a win-win. And, uh, so I'm like, yeah, um, let's do that. So when my wife came out to look at houses, um, I stayed back with my son. I remember I drank for that first time in like 10 years, you know, like broke 10 years of sobriety. And I, and I got through that and I muscled through it. And I was like, all right, it's just a one-time deal. It ain't going to happen again, but it kind of opened what, that. Well, hold on. What, uh, what prompted you to do it? Like what made, what, how did you, you know, like what brought you to do Was it just, uh, it had gotten too much or yeah. What made, what made that decision to do that? I, so hi, looking back, um, I'd had back surgery and I was 
pretty good about the pain management piece. You know what I mean? Like when, you know, you're given tramadol or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and, uh, right. you know, the pain pill piece, there was, there's a little bit of that, not, not a lot of abuse with it, but you know, one is, one is good, two is better. But then when it came time for like a refill and all that, like once I had the surgery, I was good. I just, I had a herniated disc. It was L5 S1, like crazy sciatic pain. I could stand and lay on my side and that was about it. Um, oh, man. But leading up to the surgery, there was a lot of pain. Um, so there was meds with that. And then post-surgery, there was like 30 days. And I remember they asked me, they're like, hey, do you need a refill? I'm like, no. Like, you know, because I knew that it was that was a slippery slope. Sure. But, um, and it was probably six, eight months, maybe a year after that before I drank again. But I think that I had kind of, gotten used to where that it allowed my head to go and just like not have to worry about anything. Uh, so I, I, when I'm looking back on it, what led to that was, you know, at this point I'm burnt out, I'm smoked. My marriage is, 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 is doing okay. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm present, but I'm not really present when I'm home. My brain is going 90 miles an hour. You know what I mean? I can't sleep at night. Um, and I haven't processed anything from any deployment. I literally took, you know, whoever died on that trip or whatever traumatic event happened on that trip. You know, we there's, you know, there's things that, you know, even with SF, you know, on that mission or that deployment I'm talking about where I, I didn't, you know, say cleared hot one time, you know, we're still doing med caps and there's people bringing in, I'll give you an example. The a villager brought in his kid to the, uh, the 18 Delta who was littered in shrapnel wounds because the Taliban had mortared their village, but wanted to said that we did it, you know? Yeah. And so we're treating this kid for these shrapnel wounds and I'm looking at him and you know, he's, he could have been in shock. I don't know, but he's just very stoic and he was the same age as my son. And then that night I'm talking to my, my wife on the phone and she's like, yeah, Jackson busted his head open at the seesaw. We had to go to the doctor. He had to get stitches. And you know what I said, man? And this isn't me. This isn't me. I was like, well, he needs to toughen up, you know? And, but earlier that day, I had helped the, the Delta treat this kid who was littered in shrapnel wounds from a mortar round. So like yeah. my empathy was starting to disappear. And I, and I knew that I, I was kind of becoming somebody that, that is not me and it's not my personality. And right. I just hadn't processed anything. And so it was just an accumulation. You know, I have events that there's nothing like for me, like I go to bed at night with a clear conscience. I do, you know, yeah. I, I, I know everything, you know, and there's been instances, you know, CivCast, especially working the desk, you know, the last two deployments. Um, but I did everything in my power to prevent that. Like my job, right. you know, I simply said, I, I say, well, I called an airstrikes, but really it's to prevent fratricide, you know, make sure right. the right people die. You know what I mean? Um, it's not, anybody can call it an airstrike, but can you do it the right way and make sure that, you know, you're, you're keeping your dudes safe. So um, all this is to accumulating and building up. And so I was, I just think in my head, all right, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to drink, you know, while she's gone for these few days at night after I put my son to bed, which is still irresponsible. Um, all right you know, I'm going to drink and just, just to get out of my head for this little bit of time, just, just as an escape. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, I did and ended up telling her about it. And, you know, after that, I went, you know, another couple of years and didn't drink, um, you know, at this point, does that answer your question? I think it's, it's a yeah, for sure. answer because <clears throat> there's not one. No, I totally get it. It's like a, it, you, you had gotten to a point where, uh, you were just, you needed, like you said, and it's, that's a perfect, perfect way to illustrate it is you needed an escape. You're, you're, all this stuff is right there in the forefront and you needed something you needed to pull back from it. And there was no other way that you could think of to pull away from it than, you know, get a little, get a little drunk. I mean, that's, yeah. And, that, and I, I'm glad you said that because there's a lot of guys out there that do that, that they just, they, they just shower or kind of drown their sorrows, frankly, with alcohol. Um, 
and it, because that's the only option they have, you know, I mean, they're, that's, it's legal. So it, they, you know, society encourages it. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, no, I, I totally get where you're coming from. It's not, and it's almost like, uh, when you get to that point that it's, it's your only option, frankly, I mean, it seems, you know. Yeah. And it, you know, seemingly is my only option because when I look at, when I looked at, well, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah right. When I, yeah. when I looked and, and you know what, it works until it doesn't. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, but for sure, you know, you know, I'd have had, you know, 10 years sober. So I'm like, all right, I can do this, man. I can, I can put this away. And I did, I went, you know, a couple of years and, and didn't drink, um, again. And, you know, but at this point I'd come out to, you know, troop two, you know, two seven five on the, you know, detachment chief, flight chief, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. Out here and stellar dudes, man. But, it's, it's not a knowing full well that really what I needed to do was take me and take a job somewhere where I can regroup and, you know, get my head back together. But dude, I, you know, it's Ranger, man. Like you love rank. I mean, I, I love it to this day. I still love it. It's Stockholm syndrome. You know, I love them yeah. at the same time, <laughs> but, and I would, I wouldn't, I would do it all over again, you know, um, for sure. So I come out and you know, what's interesting and what's different is, you know, I went from being a, a flight chief of independent dudes supporting teams um, to now having like 12 guys, which from in an army standpoint, 12 dudes isn't a lot of dudes. Right. But, you know, now I'm managing, helping manage, you know, what's going on in their lives. And at the same time, just phenomenal, phenomenal guys, man. Like just, I mean, I, I couldn't have asked for a better group of dudes to, to have, I, I don't even want to say underneath me, just to have, to, to have that experience to work with. And that's when I started seeing like how good these guys are. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you guys are just truly, truly, you're better than I ever was. Like I've got mm -hmm. the combat experience, but you guys are better JTACs than I ever was. I mean, your, your knowledge yeah. here is, is incredible. And, and so within that role, I was, uh, I was working, you know, it was the E7. So, you know, MLATs, I'm with talk one or talk two, you know, I'm an evaluator at this point. Um, right. And, you know, so, you know, help them with, out with the evals, which I always found interesting. I'm, I'm giving an eval to a guy that graduated weapons school, like two weeks later, you know, was like, <laughs> all right, I'm giving yeah. you an eval right now. This is ridiculous. <laughs> but, you know, right. um, I was never, I didn't like being an evaluator as much as I like being an instructor. I liked passing yeah. on that knowledge. The evaluator piece, I, I didn't like being an evaluator because I still wanted to like jump in. If you see a dude falling on his face, you know. Um, That's a good point. Like you can't help him no. because you're evaluating him. Yeah. yeah. Whereas an instructor, you're like, all right, do that, do it like this, or here, here's a better idea. But yeah, when you're evaluating, you just got to keep quiet and. Yeah let them make those mistakes. Yeah. yeah so that's tough. An evaluator role was a little tough for me because like I said, I, I, yeah. I loved instructing. The evaluating piece was just, it just wasn't tough. It just wasn't my favorite thing to do. Sure. But sure. Th the guys were absolutely amazing, man. Like I could say, Hey, I need to knock this out and, and they would knock it out. Or if, if I didn't have to say, say what, you know, what it was, um, you know, looking back on my career, I think as, as a leader in that position, there are things that I would change, you know, um, I wish I could have, I could help them get to that E7, you know, if that's what they want to do, but I yeah. couldn't help them get past that. You know what I mean? Like, cause right. I was an E7 and I was still struggling, you know, I'm going to like, you know, what do I need to do to make E8? Well, the reality is I probably need to lead the 17th for a little while, but I wasn't going to lead the 17th, you know, I'm jumping right. on any, you know, Marine Corps, senior NCO courses, you know, whatever. And you know, whatever it is to, to kind of make that rank. But I'm like, but if that means I have to leave the 17th, then I'll just retire as an E7, which I ended up doing. Yeah. But, you know, that the time with battalion at 275 was, you know, equally as good with RC, but just, just different. You know, I'm working the desk. Yeah. And dude, I'll tell you, man, like the desk, working the fires desk is a whole nother set of stressors that, that, that unless you've done it, like you, you don't, you don't know. And I, I hate to say that because you're not forward. Um, yeah. but you know, you're doing at a minimum 14 hour days. Uh, no, I mean, you're, you're slated for 12, but you end up doing like 14, you know what I mean? Sure. And, yeah, yeah. um, the way I like to have my schedule was I would come on at midnight and go on till noon 
because I could see I wouldn't get the guys out the door, but the guys would get out the door. I could support them during their mission uh, at the desk, and then I could still do kinetic strikes, you know, during the first half of the day. So oh, okay, um, that was, but that was just like it was just nonstop. I mean, the sun would come up, white shoes. <laughs> you know, what I mean, it was just like <laughs> over and over and over again. I remember, you know, one time. I looked up, they had a, a 47 go down and we had this giant, you know, Roz and I had aircraft. Stuff. I mean, just, just too much. I mean, like it wasn't yeah, even yeah. manageable. Like, you know, I, I had to have like two separate Roz's and just these guys would go, you know, they would go Winchester and I just rotate, rotate them back into the Roz. Um, but, uh, you know, working that piece, I remember one time, like it's four hours later, I look up at the battle captain, uh, and I'm like, Hey man, how many, how many nine lines did I read in that four <laughs> hours? He was like, you, you did four or excuse me, you did nine, you did nine, nine lines in that four hour period. And then off of those nine lines, there's just multiple reattacks. So I can't sure. even tell you like how many times, but you know, it was just, it was, it was busy, man. It was busy, busy, yeah. busy. And then you come back home and you fall into the training cycle. And so all I was doing, man, I was still doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And, yeah. uh, and I drank, you know, I started, you know, drinking, you know, secretly. And then, uh, one day, you know, with, um, my captain, you know, to kind of truncate the story. Um, I'm like, Hey man, I, I need to go to, to ADAPT and get this worked out. So I, I did, I went to, went to the ADAPT program and, uh, went through a, you know, a thing with, with them and it helped. And I went into like this, it was a combat trauma course, but JD, I'll tell you like, it, and, and while I'm doing this, this is like now my last year uh within the within the 17th and they brought over dax because you know 720th did an awesome job of supporting me and giving me the support i needed um dax key who one of my you know best friends nothing but great things to say about him um they oh, brought him over. awesome guy yeah awesome dude man they brought him over to take it to take my position and i found that while i'm doing this you know this combat trauma course and you know you, you got your workbooks and you're in there with the army like i could have empathy for like if you're telling me your story that can i can feel that like i can i can mm -hmm. feel your story but if i'm telling my story i uh i it's almost like i'm i'm telling it as like in second person you know what i mean like i'm stepping yeah. outside of myself and i'm telling my story so i'm not feeling my story so i'm sure. still i've gotten so good at putting my my emotions and my, my feelings away and compartmentalizing that even when I'm telling my story, like what, what I experienced, I'm not feeling it. I'm feeling yeah. this mechanic, you know, who got put on a post with a 50 cow who ended up shooting up a family of Iraqis. Like I'm feeling his story. Like I'm feeling right, it right. because I'm like, dude, you should have never been in that position anyway. You know what I mean? Like, right. but you know, but when it comes time for me to tell mine, I just, I, I, it was almost like it was second person. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I remember when I finished, I was talking with the counselor about it and I was like, Hey man, I, I feel like that I held back and it wasn't on purpose. He was like, I feel like you did too. He's like, you participated, huh. you were present. He's like, but I could tell that, that you were not, you were being as open as you knew how to be open because I think there's still more there. And I was like, yeah, hey, you're probably right. So, um, I think that I think a lot of us do that. I think, um, and not not in a self righteous way or like a toot your own horn kind of way, like you were saying before. But we're a selfless career field. We're a selfless kind of uh, people where it's mission first, family first, and we are a distant, distant third, if if at all. And when we, uh, you know, we have these experiences, and it, but it's by design because when you're in the fight, when you're fighting you don't want those bad feelings to be at the forefront. You got to put them back behind so you can get the mission done. Now that we're out, now that we're kind of like, now you're an E7, you're a flight chief, you're in the talk, you're like, you're, you're not, uh, not to say that that's a, not to diminish that, that service, but you're not uh, on the line anymore. Right. So, uh, you're, you, that's when you kind of struggled with like, I think I could see that's why you would dream because now you're, you're, you have time to, 
all those things are starting to creep back to the front and now you you're you don't have a way to deal with it i mean you're not we don't know how to open up so let's just drown i, I need a way to compartmentalize the stuff again so i'll just drown it with alcohol i'll just get it you know that's the way i can start numbing it down and and not having it affect me negatively so i know i totally get what you're saying man and that's it, it it's i think a lot of people struggle with that so yeah, yeah. so tell me that tell let's go from there tell me how because i know so that happened but like so how did you deal with it like where where have you what how has your journey gone from there to it it, kinda... it it was looking back on it i dealt with it well and i dealt with it seriously and you know i did everything that i was supposed to do and you know, I was sober, you know, you know, doing AA meetings and hey, dogs growling right now, but uh, <laughs> you know, you know, doing everything I'm supposed to do. Um, and thinking, I'm, well, let me ask you this real quick. Yeah. So you, when you, so you were said you started drinking again, did it negatively affect anything else? Or were you just like secretly drinking and then you sober I was up? Secretly good drinking work and, and it started negatively affecting things. Okay. Yeah. Like in what way? Like what, what was, what was happening? That would uh that would hint like what like because like some people drink and then they sober up and they go to work it's fine but like that doesn't sound like you're that was your situation like no, what, man, what, was, it, what was going it, on it was becoming all consuming so it was like calling okay. in you're like hey man I, I, I you know absent you know what i mean like hey, man, oh, okay. i can't make it in that, that sort of thing so it was affecting gotcha. that and um my wife and i you know we we were separated you know i was living with my captain and he, he was aware of what's going on and, and so you know, I was drinking at his house in the evenings and, and he knew, you know, he knew. So, and then we were leading into okay. a major exercise and I, I was not in a position where I could, I could make that work, you know? Okay. So it was, um, yeah, so it was, it was starting to creep into work. It was definitely starting to creep into work. Um, well, that's good. You had the wherewithal to say to yourself, Hey, this is starting to be a problem yeah. again, you know, and that you probably felt a familiar feeling that you felt before. Oh yeah. And, you're and like, I, I knew, and, and JD, here, here's the, the insanity behind it is you, you know what you're doing. You know what you're yeah. doing. Like you, or I knew what I was doing. I knew that it, this was a negative thing to be doing, that this was, this was having, I'm not dealing with my problems, you know, um, yeah. with this. Uh, but, you know, once that, you know, and I, I went through that, you know, the, the, the program and I did, you know, the combat trauma like my ability to process things and look at things was was starting to to change and i'm opening up but i'm still not open man you know what i mean like i yeah. still wasn't able to to let it let it all just to let it go like i'm still holding sure. on to it like i'm still like i'm not gonna drink i'm not gonna drink i was 10 yeah. years sober i'm not gonna drink i was two years sober after that 10 years i'm not gonna drink i'm not gonna drink i'm, I'm still like gripping that and making sure that I'm not going to go down that route, but I'm, I'm fighting it. I haven't let go of anything. Yeah. I'm fighting it because I'm still in a fight. I'm still acting. That's what I was going to say. That's a good point because it, it's not so much that not because you might as well drink because you're, it's still negatively affecting you. You're like this, you know, instead of saying, yeah, I'm not going to drink because I don't need it. And, and going on with your life, it, that is a thing. It's still in, in the yeah. forefront of your mind for I'm, sure. I'm still yeah. Carrying, you know, like, you know, there's that saying, you know, that I heard from William Shepard and, and Barbie and, you know, it's ground your ruck, you know, like yeah. ground your ruck. I'm not able to ground my ruck because I'm still, I'm still in it. You know what I mean? I'm still in it. Right. And, and you know, I, I think I'm letting go, but I'm not really letting go. You know, and I'm still fighting it. And I, I had about a year left, less than a year left. And, you know, then I was to retire, you know, and, and the, the, the squadron was phenomenal. Like, Hey man, whatever you want to do, you want to get back on status, you want to control, you want to do whatever you want to try to, you know, continue on. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm a year out, less than a year out from retirement. I'm going to retire. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to call it. So, um, ended up, you know, retiring at 20. Uh, and, you know, for me, you know, it, it is, uh, I wouldn't change my time with my, the combat experience. If they called tomorrow, I'm like, Hey man, I need you to go. I would, I would do it just like you would. I mean, like I mean, right. I'll be there, you know, which isn't going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen, but you know, that, that's right. how much you love it. That's how much you care about it. 
but what I would do, I think what I would do differently is I would, I would look at how things are affecting me and maybe process some of that stuff along the way. Um, so, you know, I, I get out and, and I retire, but that last year was tough because now I feel like I don't have a purpose. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Dax has come in, he's taken the flight chief role, or uh, you know, the detachment chief role and, you know, rightfully so. And gratefully so, man, I, I, I couldn't yeah. do it. You know what I mean? I, I was, I was at a point where, you know, I, I had, I had raised my hand, like I'm, I'm done guys. I'm done. Yeah. And so it, it allowed me to focus on like that next step of what I'm going to do um, when you get out, because it's kind of like being 18 or 21 or 22 again, you're like, okay, now what For I'm sure. going to I've lived in never, yeah. I've been doing adult stuff, but it's never, never land. Let's be honest, man. It's never yeah, because yeah. you're with your buddies day in and day out and you're having a blast. You're having yep. a blast. You know, we're, you, know, you bring up the, the low points, but there's so many high points with that too. I mean, and, right. and with that, I knew I was never, I knew that I, I was never trying to chase that same high because there, there's a feeling that you get. And I know, you know what I'm talking about. There's nothing like, you know, you're getting off the of CH 47. It's a hot HLZ. You're taking fire. You start calling it an airstrike. I mean, you can taste the air. I mean, you feel alive. Yeah. There's, there's not another alive feeling you, you have, but then there's, so I've, I've, I've never tried to chase that because I knew that that wasn't a good thing like that, that high particular, but I knew that, uh, there's other things like you're talking about your daughter, you are like holding your head's kid's hand and going on a walk with your kid and you're holding their hand. That that's another high, you know what I mean? And oh, so, yeah. <clears throat> for sure. Um, you know, th those are the things that I started to, to really try to, to appreciate and take in. So, you know, I retired in, in 2020, um, thought I was going to do the firefighter gig for a while and I was in the Academy. And dude, it wasn't for me. Like day one, no. <laughs> day one, and, and great Americans, man. Day one, they're like, this dude did like four years in the Marine Corps in the '90s. He was like, who here was in the military? So I raised my hand, and I got hired off for like five different departments. It's pretty competitive, you know. Yeah. And uh, he's like, okay, if you're in the Air Force, put your hand down. I've been retired three days, and I'm like, this isn't gonna go well. You know what I mean? You know, like, <laughs> right, right. like you have no idea what I've walked through. You're a Marine in the nineties. Good on you. Great service, man. Great service as a firefighter. Oh, so he was trying to dog you out for being in the air dog force. Me out for being in the air force. And I'm like, you know what, Jeez. this is, this is fine. You can think what you want. But, uh, so I ended up getting like my firefighter one and you know, my, um, hazmat certification and everything else. And I'm like, like this, this isn't, this is, this isn't the route that I want to go because what I realized is that I was just trading in from a health perspective. One, I felt like I already had my tribe. You know what I mean? I wasn't yeah. looking for another tribe and these, although great people, great people, you know, they come out, we do a training fire and everybody's high five. And that was awesome. That was great. That was so much fun. I'm like, JD, it, I didn't think it was fun. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. It wasn't <laughs> it, for you. It just wasn't for me. But um, yeah, yeah. so I ended up leaving that. And then I went to work with uh, doing the contract cast gig for a little bit. Um, okay. And that was fine. And it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a temporary thing though. And I knew it. And, yeah. and honestly, it was a little too close to what I was doing before. You know what I mean? Right. Like I, I wasn't yeah, yeah. getting any kind of like, like closure, you know, I'm still, I'm still holding it tight. And, um, Oh, for sure. I mean, everything you're doing is reminds you of what you used to do. So you're not, you're not getting away from anything. Yeah. You're like right in the mix, yeah. but you're not getting any kind of payoff cause you're not in combat and you're not doing what you used to do. So it's almost kind of worse in a way I could, I, I reckon I, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I did that for a little bit and, and I knew that was a stopgap. And, um, right around that time, they, uh, Sean Mignon hit me up with Warrior Pack, and um, I went to work for for Warrior Pack, and I've been with Warrior Pack ever since. And you know, we do the uh, the batteries. You know, we make batteries for you know special warfare for you know. So you know, we've been doing that, and uh, nice, dude. It's just from a company perspective. I mean, we start our for where I am in my life right now. You know, we start off our Monday Zoom meeting with gratitude what's one thing you're grateful for 
So yeah. um, it, that has been absolutely phenomenal. And then uh, I have nothing but awesome things to say about the, the company and their ethos and their core values. It, it's in line with mine. And then nice throughout that process, I also went through, I know you've had Billy Otter on. Yep. Um, and I know you talked to Sean Mignon, but yep. Sean had gone to, and I'll, I don't think he would mind me sharing this. He went through Save a Warrior because he knew somebody who'd gone through it and he recommended me go through it. So uh, I did. I went through Save a Warrior with that. Uh, and what I found, you can have all the psych docs in the world. You can have the, you know, the top of the, the whatever, but there's nothing. And it's 72 hours, man. It's three days. And that was an intense yeah. three days, but there's nothing better for the soul or for me is having people who've been in similar circumstances share their story and i and i was able to be i was able to be vulnerable i was ready to be vulnerable and you know um, nice. billy otter didn't know me he just knew that there was a 17th guy going through and he came out and uh he sat through my class and he was there for me. And I, and I, once again, man, I felt like, you know, when you're telling your story, you know, yeah. I felt that wall coming up and, and dudes, and I, this isn't a hit on them. I'm, I was jealous. They're like letting it all go. They're crying. Like from day one, right, right. they're like, they're ready. And I'm still gripping it, man. Like I'm still gripping it. And I, and I'm like, I don't think I'm going to be able to let this go. I, cause I knew I needed, I knew I needed to cry and I knew I needed to release it. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't think I would have been able to if it wasn't for Billy being there. And I, I yeah. hadn't I hadn't met him, but I knew him when he walked in. You know, you're still looking in the room. I mean, you know, this fit dude comes in. I'm like, that's Billy. It's got to be Billy. And, uh, <laughs> right. and they're like, hey, Billy, why don't, why don't you come up here, Cam, and tell Billy your story? And, uh, and then I was able to open up and let go. Um, and, and, and truly feel it. And, and that has just been, you know, for me, it's been, been a lifesaver. Um, so I've got nothing but awesome things to say about that program, but, you know, save a warrior. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been probably almost nine months since I've gone through that. And uh, okay. it's just, it's been life-changing. Um, and it's, it's not always good. Like it, the, the end is good, but what you have to right. face is daunting because I knew I was going to have to eat that elephant and how do you eat that elephant, yeah. eat that elephant one bite at a time. So, um, yeah, for me, it's, it's been, it's been good to, to let go of that and to be able to ground that rucksack. And I still pick it up sometimes, but I'm also yeah. learning, man, like I, I don't have to beat myself over what I did wrong. You know, I don't have to beat myself over, you know, if, you know, a strike went bad, um, I know that I did everything I could. And then, you know, I was talking about that deployed home, deployed home, you know, that dichotomy there of like feeling guilt here, feeling guilt there, you know, it's just letting all that go. Um, yeah. And that feels good. It feels good to be able to let all that go. And, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without safe warrior. So, um, yeah. I've heard nothing but good stuff about that whole, that program. I mean, like you said, like Billy was on, he was talking about it. He meant, you know, um, I just hear it's very cathartic for guys to get in there and just kind of, it's a, I don't, I don't know what it does. I don't, I'd, I'd love to visit and or, or even go to it just to find out what, what the heck goes on. But I mean, it seems like everybody that goes eventually lets it go. Yeah. You know, and and you know what it is? There's a, cause you go into it. I, I'll tell you. And man, this sounds, I always kind of balked at stuff like this, you know, and um, you kind of go into it, but there's a warrior mindset with it. And then there's a piece of that process where, you know, they talk about like, you know, back in the day where, you know, people would go off to war, they would come back from war and then there'd be like a ceremonial process to kind of, yeah. kind of like cleanse that and like kind of like a reset. Um, right. It's like that. It's like there's a ceremonial process that occurs throughout it, you know, without giving everything away, because I think if, if people are interested and I encourage anyone to apply and go and it's not just military they have law enforcement and first responders um as well so um but it's there's something about it that allows you it allowed me a vulnerability and to be able to shed that armor 
and to be like, and I never, dude, I never thought like I was like a badass or anything like that. I mean, I, I never had that mentality, but there was just for so many years taking my feelings and my emotions and putting them away. Um, right. It allowed me to, to like unpack all of that truly for the first time ever, like really, really unpack it. I could talk about it. I could tell yeah. you like, all right, yeah, this time this happened, I was doing a kinetic strike and, you know, um, but I wouldn't feel it. You know what I mean? And it allowed me to feel it and then let it go. It's just like, yeah, it's like holding, you know, bricks, you know, like, just, just let him go, man. You, you don't have. To. Well, I mean, you had. I think there was a defense. I mean, I don't know if it's a defense mechanism or some sort. But you had to do that in order to continue. Yeah. Like if you would, like if every time you did something wrong or every time you did something that was uh, emotionally uh, negative, you would just break down and you wouldn't be able to, you know, get up the next day and do the do the mission that you needed to do. So it was it was necessary then. But I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Save a Warrior kind of gives you some closure. Like it, like. You put the ruck down and it's like, all right, it's over. I got it. I, I can now go on to the next thing or be, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, keeping this armor up to do the next mission. You know, the missions are done. I'm done. Now you can leave it alone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, well, that's awesome, man. I'm glad. Yeah. It kind of get. it makes me, I get emotional just thinking about what you guys have gone through, man. Cause I, mean, I think that's so great because I think, like I said before with the drinking, but there's guys out there that are still holding on. They're still holding on super tight and they're, they don't know. And sometimes I was going to say this before, but like a lot of times guys don't know why they're, they feel this way. You know, your son said, you, you know, you get, you don't even realize you got that clenched fist and you know, some people just, they, they don't understand why they're upset or they don't, they don't get why they're mad. And you know, they're, they're, they're short with people and they don't, they, they can't figure out why that is. So I think a program like that would be perfect for them just to be, even if they don't even come to the full conclusion of why that is, they can still just let it go. It's got to be something with my military service. I'm just going to put the ruck down and, and get that closure. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, you know, JD, I look, I look back at pictures of myself during those time frames, and I can see it. I can see the tension in my face. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's good to, it's good to not have that. It's good. To sure. Just, it's good to just exist, man. And I'll, I'll be the first one to admit, dude meditate you know i i wouldn't say i do it every day but you know meditate on a regular basis you know um and you know i talk with billy it's been it's been a couple weeks we're, we're due we're doing another conversation but you know i talk with you know sean because we work together you know i talk with him daily you know what i mean right right and and once you unpack that stuff it's not like you have to relive it over and over again you know then it becomes it's just, it's, it's just a story, man. It's not, right. it's not, there's not an emotion attached to it anymore. It's not like you're running from it. It's just a story. It just happened. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's amazing. I just, I encourage anybody to do it, man. I think, uh, you know, save a warrior it's out there and you know, they're, they're doing great things. And for people who are kind of shying away from it because they, they think it's weak or they think it's too tough. I mean, you and Billy and Sean are some of the three of the toughest guys I know. So just know that the, that these warriors are doing it. These badasses are doing it. You can do it too. It's not, it's not a, you know, it's, there's no, there's nothing wrong with it. Matter of fact, it's the opposite of something wrong with it. That this is what you need to do. And it can, it can make you even more of a badass. I mean, you can, re, you can just relinquish that, that whatever baggage you have and just go to another level. I mean, yeah, yeah. just so just, yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. funny because, well, thanks, thanks for the badass comment, but it's funny because <laughs> I think about, you know, I, I, I still, I run a, a quite a bit and I think about in the past when a car would cut me off and one time I'm running with my dog and the car cut me off and like pulled right in front of me and I, I kick the car and the car speeds off. And then another time, you know, a car pulls like right out in front of me. I'm like, what, you know, like challenging them. And now when it happens, I think about like, you know, they might be having a bad day right now. Who knows? And, and it feels good to not. Now, I might get mad for half a second. You know what I mean? Sure. It might make. I'm not saying that I don't have an emotion or you know, anger exists. You know. Right. But even now, like when I get, if I get mad, it feels good to get mad because I can let it go almost immediately. You know. Right. You know, at least you know in the last eight months. You know, talk to me in sure. three years. We'll see. We'll see where we, <laughs> so where see where I am. I don't want to sound like I'm, 
completely full of shit there. But you know, what, what feels good is you, you're not, you still have the range of emotions. You're still allowed right. to get mad. You're still allowed to have anger, you know? Um, but, uh, there's something else. But now you have the tools to deal with it. Now, like before you might not have, you know, now before you were, you, you would get mad and it would just stick with you. But now, now you have the, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, but the ability to let it go. And, and I think, I think a lot of that, refreshing. like I feel for dudes that are still in and still struggling. Cause for me, there needed to be that break. I needed, yeah. like, I, I, I wouldn't be able to like, set my ruck down or take off my armor if I was still active duty. And I think when I was right. doing that, you know, that combat trauma course, I think that was part of the problem too, is that I'm still in the fight. I know I'm leading the fight. I know I'm retiring in less than a year. You're like, this is part of my, my, what is it, your task process or when you're, you know, you're, you know, that last year you're in the military, but I yeah. wasn't, um, I think that's part of the process too. And it's not really, it's civilian psych docs, which are great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not bashing that, but it's like, it's kind of like AA, AA it's other alcoholics helping, helping other alcoholics. These are other people yeah. with PTS helping people with PTS, you know what I mean? Right. And who've had shared similar experiences and there's nothing like that. Um, yeah. Except that piece. So it's, um, there's a little more credibility with yeah. the guys who've been through like what you've been through. Exactly. And, and even if you think that, well, I know what they're offering is good. They don't have the credibility, but they're, they've got science to back it. There's probably still some reservations that are occurring. And, sure. And I'll tell you another thing that they do really well at Save a Warrior. It's, it's not just, it's not just the combat piece. It's the stuff that happens to you before the military. Yeah. How you start like, cause that's, that's really how you start to process problems. Like the problems I have now would have probably existed even without the military. Let's just be honest. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, alcohol. Um, but uh, the, they start looking at that process early on. And that was a first because when I went through the yeah. combat trauma, I was like, like, well, what about your childhood? It's like, ah, it's childhood shit. That's over. You know, worry about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but really, <laughs> like, they make like you said, it's like, the, it's probably the core, the core reason for it, everything. Man. It's where it yeah, all yeah. started. And so they make right, you, right. they, they make you unpack all of that. And you're like, yeah. Oh, wow. So. But like, I mean, to your point, I mean, you, your parents got divorced. Yeah. Uh, you were relatively young. I mean, it's, and they, and you, they lived in completely different areas. So you had to like travel back and forth and I'm, I'm divorced and my kids, yeah. uh, you know, my two oldest, my two daughters that are old, you know, I have three daughters, the two older daughters have to do that stuff as well. So we try to be cognizant of that. We try to, you know, we, I, I tell them on a regular basis that I understand this is difficult and do you need anything? You know, I try to, I try to be attentive to that, that just that ass pain of going back and forth, you know, and let alone the other stuff that goes along with a, with a, with a, a split home. You yeah. Know, so. And you know, yeah. honestly, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going through that now, you know, with, you know, with the, going through a divorce now and, you know, my son's he'll be 17 in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's still hard for him. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I bet it would be harder for, I mean, I don't want to pile on, but it might even be a little harder for him now because you guys have been together all this time. Yeah, and now yeah. it's like, and what it's, the hell, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's one of those things where, you know, you just, uh, it just makes sure I'm there. Not, I don't tell yeah. him I'm there. I just make sure I'm there. Like I show up for at sure. night at 10 o'clock at night and then give him a hug and a kiss and tell him I love him and then drive That's back awesome. to my apartment. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, cause it. he's 17. Yeah. He's got his own life. You know, he's got a girl. Sure. He's got water polo. He's got things going on, but it's, it's how to be yeah. there. Um, and how to be there is just be there, just be. There. Yep. So that's, but even if he doesn't realize it, it's 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 having a positive effect on him for you to do that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope so. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. What? Uh, wait, there was one other thing. So tell me about the equine uh, therapy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing. So um, it's a volunteer. I think that's fascinating. I love yeah, it. Yeah, Plus, because it's with the kids. So. Yeah. So I yeah. grew up. I grew up on a. You know, I was telling you, I grew up on a cattle farm. I grew up riding horses and dirt bikes and, you know, country kid. Uh, but, you know, like I said, still listen to punk rock and ride a skateboard. It's, it's weird. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, but uh, so it's a, uh, because I grew up around horses and honestly, you know, my, she's not my ex right now, but my, my soon to be, you know, like I said, we're going through a divorce. But a year ago, she found this program. She was looking stuff up. My son needed, 
and you got to do so many volunteer hours to graduate high school. Um, so she was looking things up for him and he really loves animals. And, you know, was, she knew I lived above a barn and took out trail rides and grew up on a farm. She's like, Hey, I think this would be perfect for you guys. It's uh it's an equine therapy. Uh, it's called eQuest. Uh, it's here in the, you know, right outside of Tacoma. It's in actually in Tacoma, but it's kind of out in the sticks of, of Tacoma. If it, it exists, it's weird, but anyway, so, but what you do, it's, it's kids with special needs and, okay. uh, they, you, you're just there to like my role. Um, when I'm doing it, I go Thursdays and Saturdays, um, and it's like three classes. Um, and you're there as a sidewalker. So you have a person leading the horse and you have two people on the sides and these are kids with special needs. Everybody from, you wouldn't know it to nonverbal um, okay. and you're getting them on the horses. And I found that, you know, I'm good with the horses, but I'm also really good with the kids, you know, it's just being able to, to, to communicate. And they just, there's something about that process when they get on a horse that it changes for them, you know, whether it's a physical, yeah. um, you know, it allows them to relax or it allows them to use stabilizer muscles that they don't normally use because they're on the horse. Um, or if it's, you know, listening to the, you know, it's lead instructor, give out directions. So um, for me, it's really gratifying. You know, one, I'm, I'm helping uh -huh. kids and then two, you know, they have horses and they've got some younger horses that they're getting into the program that they need ridden. So it allows me, I, I get something out of it too, you know? So then nice. I get that, that therapy, you know, I'm helping kids. Um, I'm able to be around horses and then, you know, on other days where they don't have riders are like, Hey, she's a new horse to the program. Do you mind riding this horse? Like, don't mind at all. You know? So it's, <laughs> it's therapy for me too, man. So. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I love anything where people go and help kids. I mean, I think that's just invaluable because I don't think there's enough resources out there. I mean, a, a lot of people think of them as, you know, not their, not their responsibility, but yeah, I think that's commendable, man. That's really cool. Yeah. Kids and kids and veterans, man. If there's a, if there's a soft spot, that's definitely what it is <laughs> right. for me. For yeah. sure. Well, Cam, this has been great, man. I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. I mean, that, that especially, uh, you know, I, I just can't thank you enough for coming on and being open and letting me know about all what you've been going through and, I think it's um, I think it's important to get this stuff out to kind of give other guys uh, um, permission to seek out the same kind of help. I mean, I think you know, like I said, I got the utmost respect for you, and you've done you've went above and beyond in most guys in their in their military careers. And if you can if you can do this stuff, then then we all can. So I I, I can't thank you enough for for coming on and saying all that stuff. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you know you having me. And honestly, the the foundation that you know you set and the the bar that you guys set within, uh, within RC is, was high. I don't know that we met it, but, um, it was, <laughs> oh, uh, I'm sure you ex far exceeded it. No, I'm dude, sure. It was, yeah. uh, you know, you guys have always been, I was talking to a friend of mine and I was telling her that I was like, yeah, dude, he was like always, he was ahead of me. And so there's, it's like, I, I'm nervous. I'm not nervous because I, I'm not comfortable around him, but he was just always like, that's the dude you want to be. <laughs> It's funny you say that because I just had I've, I've had a string of guys on the, in the past that are that's how I felt about yeah. them you know just uh, you know the Marty Klukes is the Roger Crosses the Doug Tillmans uh, it's just like these guys are like and Kenny Lindsay's and Eric Mark every, pretty much everybody who I've had on has been one of just guys that I've always looked up to and just you know really I, and so I know what you're going through I know what you yeah. feel so yeah 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 thanks man I appreciate it yeah man. All right, man. Yeah. Well, uh, take care. I'm glad. You know, keep in touch. I will. Uh, I will. You know, I make it to. I make it out your way at least once a year. So I'll. I'll definitely hit you up when I'm out there. Yeah, definitely. Let's link up. All right. For sure. All right, brother. Well, uh, have a good day, and I'll talk to you later. All right. Take care, man.